Welcome back. My guest today, it's an exciting one. He, uh, he, you, can, you can see him on NBC. He was on Megyn Kelly, and he was on the Steve Harvey Show. Uh, he was in a very happy, polyamorous relationship. It was with him and two other women. He was in a thruple. It was a very, very public ordeal. Also, this gentleman has been a business coach. He's coached over 1,900 companies with his uh, smart blueprint. He's also coached 300,000 men when it comes to dating with his ACE formula. And for three years... He was ranked the number one pickup artist in the world. This is a very, very exciting story and exciting guest. So I want to welcome Mr. Adam Lyons to the podcast. How are you doing, Adam? Dude, I'm good, man. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. I like yeah. your, your screen. It's Bro, cool. I, I feel I feel like uh, our 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 uh, circles have been orbiting each other for about a decade, right? And I, it's good because I, we've never really gotten a chance to sit down and talk. You You've come to several conclusions that I have. Uh, similar, especially when it comes to female friends. And we'll get to that here in a little bit. But the first thing I want to talk about is, you know, I see the thing about you on Megyn Kelly. Now, I know you from a different world, right? Because I, <laughs> I think I met you I met you in Austin like 10 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I see on Megyn Kelly, you're dating two women at the same time. You're in a throuple and you're ha you have children with both of these women. So my first my first thing is, how do you end up doing that? Because you were you were married to Amanda when I when I met you. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so what where's the transition that happens there? And then from that point on, how does NBC and Steve Harvey and all these other people reach out to you? All right, man. So, so here, in order to, to piece it together, we have to go back to the moment I got married. Um, I was in London. I was running the nightclub scene in London. Uh, you know, P. Diddy, Pharrell, all those guys, when they came into town, they would come and hang out at the clubs that I was running. And um, I got depressed. I got to a point where I could meet and attract pretty much anyone I wanted. And... Um, you know, life just didn't have fulfillment anymore. And I realized it's because I was just doing surface level stuff. Like I was, you know, taking people to bed, getting rid of like the physical needs, but there was no emotional content. You know, I had like 14 different women that I was in a relationship with and none of it was real. So I turned around to my friend and I said, the next head turner that walks in the room, I'm going to marry her. And that was Amanda. So she walked in and sure enough, you know, a few years later, I got married. And I now, this decided is a, this is in the home. This is in London. The, when you when you see so Amanda just happened to be Amanda's an American citizen, right? Yep, yeah. she's a, a TCU uh, student. Oh, she's, she's from Fort Worth. Uh, okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And um, she came there for six weeks. Um, we hung out, and uh, I said the day she left, I said I will follow you back to America, and I will marry you. Well, well, and she went, whatever. If you do it, you do it. When you say and so, I did. When you say the other <laughs> relationships weren't real, what does that mean? Like to explain, because you understand, Adam. There's a lot of people who are like, "Oh, you're dating 14 people at one time. Oh, that's awesome, bro. Like, I that sounds like that sucks." <laughs> explain, because you have to. Okay, uh, if you ever read the setup by Dan Bilzerian, he talks about at the at very end of the book, he talks about being on a 60 million dollar yacht with 30 girls all trying to sleep with him and him him feeling depression. While he's yeah. explaining the depression, and while I kind of understand what he's talking about, you understand a lot of people are like, "This is very confusing to me. Why do you feel depression?" So you're dating 14 women at one time. Where does this emptiness come from? So um, what happens? I, I explain this a lot actually inside the Ace Formula. Mm -hmm. Attraction, we're often only attracted to our own efforts, not somebody else's. Got it. So um, you can think of this like, um, you know, if you have a favorite shoe or a favorite pair of shoes, I suppose, you know, no one wants just one. If if you lose the shoes, you're upset, but the shoes don't care. Yeah. That's because the shoes never put any effort in and obviously don't have any feelings, but we can be upset about that. Likewise, when you put effort into a relationship, that's why you end up with these one-sided, unrequited love scenarios, you know, where someone's like, oh, but I'm obsessed with you. And the other person's like, I don't even know you. So what happened was I was so good at game that women were obsessed with me and wanted to sleep with me and wanted to date with me, but I didn't really care about any of them because to me, it was just the process. Ah, oh, that's what so, you mean. Got it, got it. Yeah. So I had 14 girlfriends. I was having sex. Literally, I would have like morning sex and evening sex. It was a different girl and, and that was it, or threesomes or fivesomes sometimes. Um, it was just me and 14 girls. There was like three that kind of lived in my house on and off and the others would cycle through. When I met Amanda, I decided that was it. I was going to try and be happy. So I was like, I'm going to be monogamous. And I did it for me. It was controversial at the time in the dating industry. Like, no, you know, everyone else was trying to sleep with as many people as possible. And I was like, I've done that. Like, that wasn't cool. And so I, I ended up being monogamous and uh, we got married and life was great. I, like, we, we were so happy. And one day she wakes up, her mom had been diagnosed with some kind of hereditary thing that basically meant that because she gave birth to two children, her body would always deteriorate over time. I don't know the details of it, obviously, but her mom was it, was it, into it. Was it preeclampsia? Was that it? 
I, I don't, okay. I don't know. I didn't, yeah. I didn't want to ask like my Sorry. mother-in-law, you know, Hey, what's the, but I just know that it was a thing. She sat down with her daughter yeah. and Amanda came to me and said, Hey, just so you know, I don't want to have kids. She's oh. like, I've thought about it. Um, there's so many kids in the world that need adopting. I'm, I'm out on the let's have kids thing. And uh, that was a deal breaker. So I, I looked at her and said, I'll divorce you over this. And I, and she, she said to me, she said, no, you won't. I'm too pretty. Um, which was pretty funny because she always had like those kind of like funny little phrases. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I divorced her over it. So I filed the papers and uh, and separated. That, that, and, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, it, little, yeah, it was. Sorry, sorry. So we're, we're, it was a little <laughs> delay here. Let me let me try this again. The thing I want to ask you about is. So uh, it's funny because in Austin, Texas, I had a friend of mine, a female friend. She's really beautiful girls. Got a college degree, uh, but she was dancing at the Yellow Rose. I'm sure you're, you're aware that's that's there yep. in, in Austin. And she starts working at a bar with the biggest male whore I'd ever met in my life. This dude had fucked more girls than anyone. He used to brag about it after work. I worked with him previously. She starts working with him, and she comes to me, and she's just laughing. She's like, oh, my God, talking these stories about him fucking girls in the bathroom and all this kind of stuff. And then six months later, Adam, I'm sure you know how this ends. She marries him. Yeah. And the, one of the points I wanted to make was that this whole idea that well, there's a lot of dudes out there that are like, no, you know, there's a certain type of attraction for the good girls. And I want that type of attraction and not the type of attraction that you and Adam are doing for the bad girls. And my whole thing is, no, you got to stop watching that movie Hitch. It's just one type of attraction and it works for pretty much everyone. So I just wanted to point out once again, it's like you, even though you had your past, I'm sure Amanda probably didn't care. Or if she did, she probably found it attractive. Has that been something you've noticed? Yeah, yeah, I mean, no, that that's absolutely like pre-selection is real. Like they've they've done so many studies on this, um, that, that have like shown in I mean, I duplicated the study on a YouTube video back in the day when when I was like heavily into YouTube. We went around uh, San Marcos with a picture of a guy and a picture of a guy with two women. It was just Photoshop with two women looking at the guy, and women rated him two points higher. They've done this study so many times. You, you you can literally do it. Show a picture of you, and then another picture where you you know photoshopped in a, a woman looking at you, and you'll be scored higher. People will be like, "You're more attractive" because pre-selection is real. So if you have a whole bunch of women and a, and a past and a history, women will absolutely find you more attractive. Um, and you know, there's something amazing about knowing that you're with a guy that can get you off. A lot of guys are shit in bed because they just haven't had enough sex or haven't enough sex with enough different women to understand that different vaginas are shaped differently, that, that they need different kinds of attention. And if a guy doesn't have that kind of experience, the girl's looking at a pretty shitty sex life. You were talking about that before. So pre-selection and then experience is what you're referring to now. And there was a third thing. I forgot what it was. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, we talk about uh, it, it, that's actually the ACE form. So it's, yeah. it's pre-selection, which is abundance A. And then confidence is the second one. The last one is escalation, the ability to, to okay. turn somebody on. So yeah, three key components. So you and Amanda, uh, you guys split up. And then and then at this point, now we, we, we move forward. Is is it a conscious decision to get into a throuple? Because for me, this, what I found is that it's usually a woman I'm seeing and she's attracted to another woman and I'm just kind of the butler. I'm like, oh yeah, cool. I'm like, the, you know what I'm saying? I'm the guy who gets the Taco Bell. So, yeah, that, I always tell people like, that's the best way to have a threesome yeah. uh, is to like make it about the two women, don't make it about you. Um, and I'd had a lot of threesomes. What happened was when we separated, Amanda said to me, um, she's like, the worst thing about breaking up with you is you're going to, every other guy I've been with, she goes, I know they're never going to get as good at me. So I get to say, you'll never meet anyone as good as me. She goes, I can't say that with you because you're going to do better. And I was like, oh, I appreciate you saying that, but it's true. I, I will. And um, I was, uh, I had a friend who was a, a lesbian at the time and she was like only into women. And um, she basically professed her love to me once me and Amanda separated and uh, she said, but I'm not going to give up women for you. And I look at her and go, uh, I'm not going to give up women for you either. And she goes, oh, that's a good one. And so we we agreed that we would go and meet meet women and we would go out and we would make out and have sex. And we would also meet other women. And sometimes, you know, I would have a woman and she would have a woman. And then sometimes we'd bring women home together and, and sleep with them together. And that was kind of how it was. And our, our relationship developed. And one night we were out. Um, I was actually teaching a student um, a game and he failed on a girl like four times, but she was so hot. Uh, she was a photographer from Hollywood at uh, Austin Fashion Week, uh, which believe it or not, Austin has. I know you know, but most yeah. people don't. 
And um, and after he'd failed, he said, yeah, you can never get a girl like that. Like, you know, she was just in a bad mood. I was like, anyone can get anyone if you know what you're doing. And he goes, you're telling me you can go and talk to her now after I after she's in that kind of foul mood. And I failed four times. I was like, yeah, watch me. And so I went straight up to her, got talking to her. And then um, me and Brooke, we bounced her. Brooke was the, the other woman I was seeing. And we went out. We spent the whole night together. Uh, we went back to bed. We took it to a strip club. Uh, we met a waitress in the strip club. This is the craziest story. Um, Brooke and her were making out and the waitress comes up to me. She's like, are you jealous? I was like, why would I be jealous? I'm going to get both of them later. She goes, well, I'm jealous. I was like, don't be, join in. And she did. So our first <laughs> night together was me, the waitress from Palazzo. There you go. Okay, so I was, uh, the, I was the DJ at Palazzo for two and a half years. Oh, that's, okay, that's yeah. too funny. So um, which, which years? Uh, so this would have been, so I was the DJ at Expose from, uh 2000 until 2004 no 2003 uh and then i was at palazzo during that time also because it opened after the second year i was at expo okay so yeah this is yeah this was was late i was was, like oh you might know i was the manager i was a manager at crazy lady and then i was uh, which is called zero now i think and then i was the dj at at sugars until february of 04 and then i joined the military i saw i I swore into the military in february of 04 yeah Uh, that's awesome all right so yeah so i this is much later than that but yeah so um so long story short the four of us had sex and but the the girl uh who who i'm now um about to get married to i'm engaged to eve went back to to la where she lived in hollywood and um we just had a long distance relationship that lasted a few years meanwhile me and brooke you know we slept with other people and then we ended up moving to LA. So when we moved to LA, we didn't have anywhere to crash. Brooke said, uh, Eve said, you can crash with me for a couple of weeks. We crashed with her. The relationship deepened. Um, and then me and Brooke had a kid. Um, Brooke already had a kid from a previous relationship that I'd mostly adopted because mm-hmm. I kind of came into his life when he was 18 months old. Mm. Um, and I wanted to be a dad, obviously, which is the reason I left Amanda. Um, and me and Brooke had always decided like we could co-parent, even if the relationship didn't work out. That was like a factor because she you know, primarily preferred women. Um, and then, yeah, uh, we ended up um, seeing Eve probably three, four nights a week. And then Eve says to us one day, hey, I want to get a bigger place. I'm thinking about moving by the beach. And mine and Brooke's rent was up at the same time. And we said, well, you know, business is booming. We're thinking the same thing. Why don't we move in together? So we moved in together. Brooke gave birth to Dante, uh, which was our, you know, my second child, I suppose. Um, and then um, Eve, after seeing Dante during the pregnancy, she was like, I don't know if I want to be with you guys. Um, so that was kind of awkward. Um, but then when Dante was born, she was like, no, I I do want to be with you. And the factor was the kid. She didn't know if she was ready to be a sure. mom. Sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. The record. And um, But once Dante was born, she fell in love. And uh, the reason everyone knew about us, so we'd been together like two and a half years at this point. And um, that's when Eve decided she wanted to have a kid. But um, a journalist reached out to us. She'd just finished like graduated, um, you know, journalism school or what have you. And she wanted to try freelance work. So she looked for the most unique story she could find. Mm. And a friend of hers knew me. So she reached out and said, as a favor, can I write a piece for you post graduation for my first thing? And I was like, you know, I felt bad, like a college girl just come out of uni because we weren't being public about the relationship really. We were keeping it under wraps because we didn't really want to use it as as a marketing tool, you know, it's our relationship. Um, and, uh, so she wrote it and the next day I wake up and my phone is blowing up and I'm on the daily mail, the telegraph. I've got phone calls from people who want me to go to TV shows in New York city. And suddenly everyone knows about our throuple. And I, I think, it. I think what makes your throuple, uh, strange, like, I don't know if you know, uh, the point guard for the, the Hawks, he's in a throuple also, he's dating mm-hmm. two lesbian women, but he doesn't have kids with both of them. I think that's what yeah. made yours a little bit unique. The other thing is that you really weren't a, a, a lot of times when you see this type of relationship, there's a lot of like this weird sort of, I'm trying to think like ickiness to it or like creepiness or like almost like pseudo pimp game, stuff like that. There was none of that with you. You were in a happy relationship with the three of you were all taking equal share parts of the relationship. The two women had a relationship and then you had one with each one of them and it was very loving. I think that's what made your polyamorous relationship different than the other ones that people had seen before or things that made it weird. Um, Also, it's a polygynous relationship that you're in because I'm sure you get this question often. If one of the women that you were seeing wanted to bring in another dude, what would you say? So, yeah, it gets it gets interesting. This came up a lot. Yeah, Um, it, it was always up for debate. But what we also said was. Don't bring anything to the table you don't want. Yeah. 
So we don't want hypothetical scenarios because hypothetical scenarios are weird. Like, what if I left you one day, right? That's not a good conversation you want to be having. Yeah. So I was like, look, if you ever want to bring another guy, sit and actually talk about it. If you don't want it to happen, don't bring it up. Let's not talk about it. And whenever I said that, the discussion was always, okay, yeah, I don't want to. Yeah. And that was it. Because it was always a theoretical conversation, not a, yes, I actually want something. Exactly, like something. yeah. Have you, yeah. Have, you, have you been in a situation where people outside of your relationship have asked you this question? What, what, you, that's the answer that you give? Don't, talk, don't bring it up unless you want it? Unless you want it. Yeah, I, I've had, um, like, for their relationship or for mine? No, no like, uh, so for instance, your relationship, because it is a, a function of a public, it's a public thing now, I'm sure you get, and it's usually women who ask me this question, what happens when one of the women wants to bring home another dude? My answer is, we just don't. And they're like, isn't that a double standard? And I'm like, yes, it is, it is a <laughs> so, double yeah. standard. So, <laughs> so I always, yeah, it's funny. I always say to them, look, um, Every one of us can bring to the relationship whatever we want right. and can bring up any subject for talking about and any subjects available. The women know if they want to bring up this subject, it's available to talk about. It would be weird if I came home one day and there's a dude in the living room. Yeah. It would be just as weird if I came home one day with three women and they were like, who are these women? Right. That would also be weird. So it would have to be spoken about. And I was like, as of today, they have never said, I want to bring somebody into the relationship. Therefore, this conversation hasn't happened. And whenever the women would say it to my partners, which did happen, the women had two different answers. Brooke would say, I'm not really into dudes. Um, and um, Eve would say, um, I suppose I'll bring it up if I ever care, but Adam fulfills me in every way I need. Why would I need anybody else? Right. So I, I think it stems from jealousy, right? This idea where you've got two women. It's like, no, we had two partners each. Yes. That's the difference. And when you see it like that, you realize everyone's got the same here. It's not about tit for tat, which I think actually shows an issue with a lot of real relationships, which are based on, well, I've got this, so I need that, or you've got this, you know, like like this, like some kind of compromising exchange barter system, which isn't how a real relationship should be. The only question is, is everyone satisfied and getting their needs met? Yeah, I think- yeah. I th I think that's the issue. I think a, a lot of heterosexual women would look at that and be like, oh, these women are compromising their ability to be in a monogamous relationship for to serve this man. And they don't understand, no, these women want to be with each other. And if you're a heterosexual woman, you might not be aware of that feeling that these two women have for each other. And so in their st standpoint, Adam's the one being selfish and like, no, you don't. You have to look at it from all three, the, all three people's point of view each person has two partners so I, I do I completely understand what you're saying and sometimes to some people it may be foreign what I'm curious is specifically talking to Megan Kelly or talking to Steve Harvey what did did you did they seem welcoming were they curious did they seem judgmental in any way it was it was pretty funny man um Megan Kelly was super about us like it was a really warm uh welcoming everyone in the audience was great Steve Harvey was crazy. We went in the audience with like on the show without him. Yeah. And so we're sitting in the room and the audience were riled up against us. So they were booing, kissing. And there was like producers that were telling our story in a not very nice way. So they attacked us. And Steve Harvey came out and shut them all down and said, listen, this is not what I would do. But when I was younger, and everyone cracked up. Yeah. And so I, you know, I think that was just like TV show gimmick. Like they try to create that scenario so Steve Harvey could come in and, and win the day. But he was super open and receptive. Um, you know, we got interviewed so often. And you remember this was our relationship for like two and a half years for anyone new. This we weren't just in a relationship, let's sensationalize this. This yeah. was very real for us. So we had already worked through all the problems that would typically be needed. So some of the stuff people would say, like, they'd be like, well, what do your kids think? It's like, what do you mean what do my kids think? Go, They've got three parents. It's like the average kid in America has three parents. The only difference is the parents hate each other. Yeah. And they went, well, yeah, that's true. I'm like, right. So, and they're like, well, what about when you have sex? Who has sex in front of the kids? It was just all these like very real answers because we weren't faking. It was real. And so the, the complaints people had just, didn't mean anything, you know, yeah. like we, we had done it. And, and I'll be honest, we had, are still in it. We're not in that relationship, but we never stopped being poly. Um, and we've been in, in many throuples since, and are, you know, are back in the scenario with, I've got two living girlfriends again. Yeah. I'm just not 
Yeah, actually, it's the first time I've said it publicly. I'm just not telling people because, you know, it was pretty invasive having the media in of your course. house every day. Of course. Um, which is funny because I'll get people message me every so often and be like, ah, but it didn't work, did it? I'm like, it worked for seven years. And our current relationship is a year long. And there's still two women living in my house with me every single day. Yeah, I, 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 people keep people. losing that point. It's like you, it, it didn't work. I was living with two women for seven years. Like they did work just fine. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's like I went to Disney World and then I left Disney World. I guess it didn't work. No, I had fun at Disney World. When I was at Disney World, it was fucking fun. I didn't bring Disney World home with me. It was still, my life is still great. It didn't end, I didn't end up losing anything. I want to ask you something. We're going to skip around because you did bring up Steve Harvey. I didn't realize that you went on Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey has a viral video out where he talks about, I can't be friends with women have you seen this you should get you check um, it out i haven't seen it but he made uh he made allusions to that even on the show yeah um that like he's obsessed with women but like but you know he said it's a choice he was like choose to be monogamous yeah um and it, it's very very clear that he f well at least to me it's clear that he feels like he wants to but has chosen not to and that that was i, I resonate with that that was me when i was married yeah i chose to be monogamous and that was the whole point I was never going to cheat because it was a very clear thing. And when we opened our relationship, we both knew that was going to happen. There was no question. It was like, okay, not having kids, this is now going to happen. I have a friend of mine. She's a fantastic photographer. And uh, I'm not, I'm not going to say her name, but she was in a relationship where she was bringing women home on a regular basis to her husband, and he cheated on her. I'm not a judgmental individual. Uh, whatever, if you, wh whatever floats your boat. That motherfucker's a piece of shit. I'm sorry. You are <laughs> screwing it up for the rest of us. If your girl is bringing women home and you cheat, you are a low-life motherfucker. I'm sorry. I do not care what kind of judgment you give me for that. That is ridiculous for, for, for you to be in a situation like that. Tell the truth. But, uh, but in the situation you were talking about before with Steve Harvey, uh, you got a lot of hate for, and, I, and I've gotten not nearly to the level you have, for this idea that I have teammates, my female friends who I care about very much. Uh, I'll, I'll have like, let's say 100 female friends and then I'll be dating a few of them, but I won't be dating all 100 of them. And the, the women in my life help me meet other women. They introduce me to other people to network with. They get me invited to every single exclusive party there is. I'm hosting the Maxim party. I'm hosting Swimsuit USA. I'm hosting this huge, huge influencer party uh, in August, and it's only because of the women that I'm friends with. Can you talk about how you having female friends was led? So it's funny because the Red Pill guys believe in pre-selection, but don't believe in female friends, which doesn't make any sense to me. Can you can you go into that? Dude, I mean, like, I, I went over this in another podcast recently. Like, the, the whole Red Pill origin came from um, the, the PUA hate threads which was an anti pickup thread, which came from the old Barry Kirky forums. And like that, that's the same kind of crowd. Now, obviously it's cycled through, but those ideologies, you know, I always told people there are two sides to pick up. There's a good side and a bad side. And most people aren't aware there's two sides. So I used to hate it because people would say Adam's a pickup artist. And I'd be like, kind of, but not really. Like while other people are talking about trying to go out and get laid, I was talking about making genuine connections with women and helping them have sex with you and that was easier and better and i preferred it and i felt like a good person at the end of it so you know there's always been two sides what happened is somewhere down the line it splintered really badly and i, I believe that the turning point was the barry kirky show um which which is neither here nor there the point is the red pillars are the what we would have called back in the day the keyboard jockeys the ones who understand the theory because they've read it but haven't actually gone out to apply it to realize that there are real life ramifications yeah. and things you must do in order to make it work. And they'd rather just hate on it than then accept that. Yeah, I think there's one further step. Uh, it's the mechanism and the magnitude. What I think has happened is like, whereas you and I would understand concepts of evolutionary psychology, like the book behind me, uh, one of the concepts might be men, women prefer taller men versus shorter, or men, women prefer men who can uh, gain more resources than men who cannot. The, the thing is, while we know that to be true, there's scientific surveys that clearly show this to be true, that is not now justification to hate women. This is where I think you and I would separate from a lot of those people. They're like, well, the world is this way, therefore I hate women, therefore incels, MGTOW, and things like that exist. And from my standpoint, it's like, well, if this is the way women, is the, if these are the things women are attracted to, then these are the things we should probably be doing. Well, yeah, but and this is the thing. There's so much more than that, right? Like, like I said, you know, we've trained three hundred thousand guys. Yeah, I've trained guys who are rich, who are tall, and not getting any results. And the incellers, I, I guess, would hate them too because they're like, "Well, you've got all the resources," because it breaks that theory. Because 
yes, there is a, um, a benefit to being able to have resources and height, but that's not a requirement. And it also isn't the only factor. Yeah. I, there are so many triggers of attraction and so many uh, you know, factors that, that build into it. And most people just don't grasp the whole fucking picture. And because they don't get that whole picture, they don't understand. And they'll argue on a very specific point. Like, I, you know, I, I got into not an argument, but it was on another podcast the other day where I was like, yeah, my, my success rate is like about 100%. Like, and the guy's like, no way, no way. And I was like, it is. But you got to understand, I don't consider the game starting until I've already got to know her. Yeah. I don't look at a random person in the street and be like, that one. And he's like, well, that's not 100%. I was like, who would? She could be crazy. I've dated those women before and been terrified. You know, how do you know she doesn't have an STD? Like, there's so much wrong with, I'm going to point and choose, which was like the old school mystery method concept, like way back in the day. So when I started refining it and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So like the point that I tend to decide is after I've spoken to somebody for about half an hour. Yeah. If I've, if I've had a chat for somebody for half an hour, that's when I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it or not. And I'm, you know, we have a secret text thread, me and my friends and like my, my, my students, like my high end students. And I'll say to them, I'll take a picture of her. And I'm like this one and I'll get her because I've already spent enough time with her not to attract her, but to know if I even want that person. And the argument I gave is, if I go into a bar and I want the hottest girl and I don't know anyone in the bar, I have no pre-selection, the best chance to get the hottest girl is to talk to about four or five other women first and build pre-selection. When I take somebody home to score 100%, do I also have to sleep with the four or five others that I use to talk to the one? Is, yeah. is that considered a it, failure? It's so interesting, dude, because I mean, you've probably seen on my social media, I have pictures with 50, 60 girls. And like, do you guys really think I'm sleeping with all of them? Like, and even Bulzarian is like, dude, I take these group pictures. No, I'm not sleeping with all these girls. What's happened is, like in, so in Dan's uh, position, he's got, he used to have Bianca Gezi and now he's got Masha Diduk. These girls are, who are friends of his, they actually recruit girls to come to the parties, the Ignite parties. And so, and I'm, I'm one of the recruiters also for those. Same thing for the Maxim parties and stuff like that. These are girls that you're friends with that actually help you meet more people. Not just other women. By the way, there's several billionaires that I've met because I have some female friends that are incredible. These girls are incredible networkers and the incredible business people. In fact, the woman who taught me how to trade, who was getting 56% returns from her hedge fund, she's a 60-year-old woman who I'm friends with. You better believe as much money as she's made me, you better believe I'm friends with her. This is a problem that a lot of dudes <laughs> have is they legitimately think that they cannot be friends with women. And this is a problem because you're cutting yourself off from any um, cold approach is arithmetic social circle is geometric, right? It's two, and, and, like, and that's, that's one of the main things that I see different. Here's another thing I wanted to point out. When you, when you have those guys who are like incels, MGTOW guys, they're angry when it is a guy who they call a Chad, right? Who has the status or has the good looks or has the resources. They're even more angry when you show a guy who's five foot one who gets girls. Because yeah. you're because because you're attacking their religion. When you actually show them, hey, you know that thing you said about looks, money, status. I'm not saying it doesn't help, but here's a guy who didn't have any of those things, and he's incredibly successful. And I show pictures, and they're like, the pictures are photoshopped. You obviously paid all those girls, and 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 then and then they're fucking angry at you because you're you're attack like their life makes sense if the world is out to get them. And as soon as you show them you don't have to be a victim, then they realize the mistakes that they've been making. Then they get even, instead of saying, oh man, Michael, thank you. Adam, thank you for showing me this light. They're like, fuck you, dude. You've made, like, because you've made their life even more confusing and you've attacked their religion. Well, I, I always talk this about people, it's what I call a worldview, right? When you make a decision that is detrimental to your life based on something that you believe but don't know, it is very hard for you to reverse that yes, belief yes. because you have made a negative decision on your life based on what essentially at the time was a guess, a gamble or a feeling or, or an emotion. And I see this all the time. Like I had a, a buddy of mine who was a bodybuilder and I was like, why do you work out? And he goes, I work out to get women. I was like, but you're still single. And, um, and he would like laugh about it. I was like, dude, you should let me teach you dating. And he'd be like, dude, I don't need it. Like I've got this body. I was like, but you're always single. And I've always got a girlfriend. I'm always getting laid and you're not, but you're ripped. And he's like, yeah, to get girls. I was like, do you not? So we were hanging out with like <laughs> sticks of my really good female friends. I was like, guys, here's a picture of me naked. Well, like topless. Here's a picture of my friend. 
And he was like, yeah, look at me, you know? And I was like, which body are you more attracted to? And they all went, Adam, you, without a doubt. And the guy's like, no way, look at my muscles. And they go, yep, that's guy attractive. I'm just not into it. We lost our friendship over that. He refuses to talk to me to this day. Yeah. Because of that moment. Because he had put so much energy in the gym. Not because he wanted to win a fitness competition because he'd never entered one. Not to be healthy, but to be attractive. And it had never worked. So in his head, he just needed to get an extra pound of muscle. That was it. Like one more pound of muscle will be the exact pound of muscle needed yeah. to get the next woman. And, and I, you know, you know, I explained to guys, like, there's like 10 qualities that a guy needs to be displaying. And if you can have all these or as many of them as possible, your success rate goes up. Like a woman is going to take a guy who's funny over a guy who makes money, like almost all the time. And a guy who's funny but can't pay his bills and can't afford to take her out for dinner, yeah, that guy is probably not going to do very well. But a guy who's funny and he's got a good job and he can afford the basics and he can, you know, treat her on a vacation once in a while, but he has her in stitches every day. She's laughing and she's so happy. Like some rich guy coming in who's not funny and kind of boring, he's not going to win. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. It's uh, it's funny. I, I don't know if you ever read Why Women Have Sex by Dr. David Buss and Sidney Meston at UT Austin. They wrote it from the laboratory and they go over all these different reasons why women have sex. There's 237 reasons that they bring up in the book. And it's, it really is when you like put these out on a normal distribution, you will find that there are some women like completely transactional. It is money and there's nothing else they care about. There's some women, it's completely physical attractive. I know some women, it is literally one dumb male stripper covered in tattoos after another and they do not care if these motherfuckers can read. And then I know some women, like most women, I would say the majority, just like what you said, how does he make me feel when we have a conversation? Do I feel comfortable? Do I feel protected? Do I feel loved? And then that, those are the ones that they want. But it is different because what happens is the, the, the people who don't agree with what you're saying, they're going to look for these one or two or three outliers where it's a girl who's only interested in status or money. And then they're going to say, ah, you see everything that Adam Lyons is saying is not true. And of course that, <laughs> that, that's, it's ridiculous. Like they're going to look for one out. And again, statistical, if I say there's an 80% chance that it's going to rain tomorrow and it doesn't rain, it doesn't mean I was wrong. It doesn't mean I was wrong. People don't understand how statistics works, how normal distribution yes. works. People are attracted to different things. Now, you did bring up something before you said you talked to a girl for 30 minutes and then you decide whether or not you like her. The qualification. Uh, I want to yep. talk about this uh, qualification idea. You're probably the first person 10 years ago that I'd heard use that term. I had an idea of that, but I didn't have a word for it. So can you go over how qualification works for you and how it helps? And what are the things that, uh, what are the components of it? Yeah, so about 17 years ago is when I first wrote out my model and it's evolved so much since then. But back in the day, I realized that um, there was like, a four four things that needed to be hit on and one of them the third one was qualification uh, i i've changed that now i actually think qualification comes a lot earlier um but it depends on on how confident you are qualification is where you qualify somebody to see if they're right for you um you can think of it like you know when we take a qualification or we get a certificate we are proving somebody i am qualified for this role right like i have a certificate because i qualified this test therefore i am qualified to do it when you qualify somebody, you're asking a number of questions to identify if they are right for you. And I have learned through teaching 300,000 guys that a lot of men make their qualification on something that every guy wants, at which point it's not a filtering system. It's not a qualification. That's standard, right? That's like saying, I only want a woman that breathes. It's like, yep, that's every guy. Every guy wants that. You know, that, well, hopefully every guy does, right? <laughs> Whereas, um, so guys were like, she's got to be beautiful, fun, and intelligent. And I'm like, hey, any guy that wants to date a woman who isn't beautiful, fun, and intelligent, you just raise your hand. And of course, no one raises their hand. Yeah. I'm like, these are minimum requirements, guys. This is not, uh, this is not actually your qualification. And guys are like, yeah, but I've got to have that. It's like, well, until you work out what the other things are you want, you won't get that. Because a woman doesn't, doesn't judge herself based on those three things. Because, of course, everyone's trying to strive for the best they can in those things because they're basics. So I've learned, like, like Eve, right? And, and Brooke was the same. And, and the other woman that we're seeing right now is the same. Me and Eve, we spend our evenings playing Dungeons and Dragons, playing video games, uh, you know, watching horror movies, um, you know, playing Magic the Gathering. Like we're nerds, right? Absolute nerds. She's also ridiculously hot and likes having threesomes. 
exactly the same as the other woman that we're dating yeah. and every other woman that we have been in a throuple with. Because one of my criteria is they have to be a nerd. Because what really sucks for me is to hang out with a really hot girl and she's like, so yeah, I was thinking about going to the baseball game tomorrow. And I was like, I don't want to do that at all. And that doesn't sound fun. Interesting. So you, you got to qualify. Yeah. And the minute I qualify, I'm like, okay, this girl's hot into the same kind of nerdy shit that I am and likes other women. That's a hundred percent. I won't fail to get that girl. There's no question. And I'm motivated. <laughs> like, I'm like, no, I gotta have that one. Um, d- is way off topic. Have you played Elden Ring and are you going to watch uh, house of the dragon? <laughs> okay. So yes, I'm going to watch house of the dragon first of all. Cause I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not really that upset about the ending. It was bad, but whatever. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't care. Hold I, don't, against... I, I don't hold it against George R. R. Martin. By the way, George R. R. Martin right. wrote Elden Ring. For those of you who don't know, it's a new video game. It came out. It took like three years to make. It's fucking fantastic. I beat it two days ago. It took uh, about 150 hours. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> it, 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 it feels like Game of Thrones. It's absolutely fantastic. But I was wondering your Dungeon and Dragon stuff, if you've played it yet. So, so true story. I'm not a video game player. Okay. I'm a board game player. But Eve is. So it's hysterical. If you come over our house in the evenings, you'll see me cooking and Eve is playing video games. And like guys that don't know us walk in and go, what's going on? Why is he in the kitchen? And why is he? <laughs> That's funny. And she, and yeah. And she'll be like, my bitch is making me a sandwich. And yeah. we laugh. But I genuinely love cooking. Like you, I post it on social media. Yeah. I've been cooked. My dad was a cook. My granddad was a cook. It's like what we do. Um, and it's like one of my love languages is I cook for people. And uh, but it's really funny. She is a video game player. So um, so she's played, not me. Okay, uh, but I've heard it's good. Yeah, it's fantastic, dude. If you like Game of Thrones, have you read the book? Have you read the books? Have you read A Song of Ice and Fire? I have, yeah. Yeah, uh, so th- that and all the other books that have come out the 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 what's it the Fire and Blood series that's come out, those are really good. So I'm I'm super excited. We're actually thinking about doing a show here just on. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but when Game of Thrones, the last season, the number one podcast, the like five of the top ten podcasts in the world were all Game of Thrones reaction podcasts. I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Yeah. yeah, it's actually funny. I was hanging out with the mountain the other day. I became friends. Oh with yeah, Gregor. Or uh, yeah, what's his name? I forgot the guy's uh, Half Thor. That's uh, his name. Yeah, yeah. that, that did. Yeah, Half Thor That's, Pearson. that's uh, dude. He he's awesome. He's so great. It's funny. I met him randomly at an event, and uh, and we sat down and we got talking to each other, and he wanted to pick my brain about a bunch of stuff, and I was like, dude, I gotta be honest with you, man. I'm kind of I'm kind of pissed. The way you did that guy in with the thumbs through the eye, yeah. it's like, oh, come on. I was like, no, I'm no. Uh, and it's funny because he's a he's a boxer now. Uh, yeah. He actually did an amazing fight in Dubai. And uh, but I've I've challenged him the next time he comes over to my house, it's like I want to have a sword fight with him because I used to be a pro sword fighter. I was like, I need to fight you, dude. And he's like, we can box. And I was like, I might even do that. I just, you know, want to get wrecked. <laughs> this is... he's... You should, you should tell him, hey man, if you want to get better with women, you need to get stronger. That's what you need to do. That's what you, <laughs> I used to say that too. <laughs> yeah, get stronger and taller. You need to get taller <laughs> and bigger. You need to get bigger. Yeah. If you're a bigger human, you can only bench actually, 700. What's wrong with you? It's actually funny. One of one of the women, uh, our girlfriend, the other one, with uh, she's taller than me. Um, yeah. And I, the, one of the reasons I started dating her is because she's taller. Um, because um, I had students that were like, you don't know what it's like. You're six foot. You've never dated anyone taller. I was like, I'm going to do this. Um, and when she's in heels, she's six eight in heels. She's huge, and um, you know it, it's just a really funny experience to go out with somebody who's that much bigger than you. Um, and she said to me, she's like, "Why do you always encourage me to wear heels?" I was like, "You look better in heels." And <laughs> she says, "She's like, I've never dated a guy that says I should wear heels before." I was like, it, "I literally want you to be taller. I think it's awesome. It's a marketing was, tool. You know, <laughs> it's yeah." And she's marketing. like, "But you're not." She's like, "You're not intimidated at all." I was like, "Why would I be? You're tiny." And she's like, she's like, I'm not tiny. I'm taller than you. I was like, whatever, maybe physically, yeah. but not emotionally. You know, it's like, it's just that she's You're cracking up. Tiny. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. I know, that's, uh, and like, honestly, it's funny until people meet me. Like, that's my game. My game is I'm really funny. Um, that's like a large part of what I do is women when they're around me, they're in hysterics. Um, and I'm not intimidated by anything or anyone. Um, so. That's another side. Uh, let's talk about this. You, it's a really interesting story that I thought. So you're you're named the top pickup artist in the world three years in a row, and at the same time can't pay your mortgage. Can you talk about yeah. this this dichotomy where it's like you're doing the and then on top of that, you know, there's people who you coached who are going off and making millions of dollars. Can you talk about this period of your life where you're in? For, for yeah. Example, actually, let's transition before that. <laughs> first off, you're bringing a bunch of girls to the clubs, and then people start asking you to asking to pay you to teach them how to meet girls. And yeah, then I didn't want to teach. 
Yeah, I never wanted to teach dating. I just wanted to use it for myself. So I named myself AFC Adam so people would leave me alone because people used to bug me for game stuff. And I just didn't want to help. Um, I liked hanging out on like the online groups so I could like get answers. And I would help out a little bit online. But I really, I, I don't really care about impressing other people, which is why I didn't really brag about my relationship for years. Like I just, I'm not that interested in it. Um, and uh, there was a bunch of reasons why people knew I was good. One point, uh, somebody in a group, and this is like totally reactive, and I shouldn't have done it, but there was a guy that was asking for threesome help, and he was like a dating coach, and I gave him advice. I was like, here's how I get threesomes, and he goes, I only want advice from people that actually know how to have them, Adam. We all know you're fake, and unfortunately for him, uh, I do have a habit of filming myself having sex because I think it's awesome. I just Unfo don't post unfortunately for him. Unfo yeah. <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> for him. <laughs> so I edited the video without my penis in it yeah. and uploaded the video. And it was like, this is like, you know, 2007. So I put like Last Resort, you know, Papa Roach. And it was that music video. And it was just cut with me fucking four chicks, yeah. but cutting out all, you know, we're not underwear. It's all the pre-sex stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it was very clear, like we're grinding on yeah. each other and everything. And one girl's like pouring wine down her tits for the other one to drink out yeah. of her pussy and shit. And it was just pages of LOL owned, LOL owned on this group yeah. to this guy. He quit. Like that was it. That was the end of his dating career. Like he yeah. vanished off the face of the planet, but that was it. People started wanting to learn from me and I didn't want to teach. And I remember this guy just like offered me 10 grand and that was more money than, than I'd ever seen. So yeah. that, that was how I started teaching. You know, I was like, well, if you can pay me that much, I'll do it. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I was really irritating a local company called PUA training. They wanted me gone because I was just bad mouthing every major company. Cause I didn't really want to teach. And I just did it for the cash. Cause I got paid for the clubs, you know, yeah. cause I was like the biggest promoter in London and um, PUA training really wanted me gone. And I sat down with the owner of the company. He goes, how much to you know, fuck off? And I was like, well, I met this chick in America. I was like, I really want to get married. I need a visa and I need a company to sponsor me. And he's like, give you a visa, pay for it. And we'll give you half of all the revenue you generate in America from our mailing list if you fuck off to America and leave the UK. And so that's how I ended up coming out to America and, you know, PUA training sponsored everything, which was um, Oh, amazing. fuck, man. I just, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm remembering this. I did not know that's how you had an affiliation with him. That's nuts. Okay. Yeah. So, and like, and I love Richard now and, and I'm so thankful for what he did. Like, cause I, without him, I couldn't have afforded anything. I was broke. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's when I came out to America and I'd already been voted like number one in the world before I came. So I came out and, and got it another two times. Um, and for people always wondering, like, how did they vote for you? It's very simple. It was everyone at this big global summit. Everyone got invited. Anyone could go. It was a hundred bucks. And anyone that went, it came with a voting ticket. You could vote. Um, what I'm really proud of uh, isn't the fact that I became number one in the world. It's that I ended up being like number two and number three on a bunch of other categories, like best online coach, all these other ones that I didn't even nominate myself for. It's just I was helping so many people. People put my name in. You know, so I ended up, I got ranked like, you know, top three in, in almost everything back, back in the day. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I trained up a guy called Matthew Hussey, who a lot of people know uh, from Get the Guy. That was one of my students. Um, so, I, you know, I've trained a lot of very successful uh, dating coaches, but I just never really cared about it for myself. I've always been cared more about my own life, like and what I want to do, not really, you know, uh, about going out there and being the best at anything. Um, but it all came to a head when, you know, the first time I got voted, well, first time I got voted number one, I couldn't afford anything. I couldn't pay my my freaking rent. Um, and then every other time I just couldn't pay my mortgage. I just didn't have enough money because I wasn't focused on business. I was focused on, you know, enjoying women or enjoying my marriage or helping the students I was helping. And uh, and that was that was a detriment. So I needed to learn business. And that's when uh, I really started falling in love with business. I'd been resisting it for so long. Yeah. But once I you know, embraced it, I realized that I had a chance to use all my skills in dating and, and human psychology to, to learn, and it all applied. And I wasn't just good. I, I got really good and uh, and prefer it because I never, like I said, I never wanted to teach dating, but, but growing businesses and helping businesses. I mean, during COVID, I worked with hundreds of companies and I would, you know, people would phone me, thank you so much. We saved our business. We were going to go bankrupt. And it was just eye-opening. That I could like save so many people, you know, during, um, I don't know if you saw uh, the, the crisis in, in Ukraine when Russia uh, invaded, I, I did a, a campaign online, generated uh, $600,000 for orphans in Ukraine within the first week of it happening. Mm. Um, you know, they wrote about me in you know, a bunch of news articles, Fox News and everything like the, the Texas business consultant who's saving orphans. 
but um but that's really what i'm motivated by i'm motivated by that stuff more than i am about you know my own pride i suppose so so these are these are different stages that people go through sometimes if you're, i'm sure you've seen this before a guy who's like ridiculously good looking in his early 20s has no trouble with women and because of that he doesn't focus on money because of yeah. that and he, he ends up going his whole life like living on couches and like he just because oh, he just really like you that. know a ton of I do too they they're really yeah. good there's there's a, there's just this trope here in Las Vegas about the dude who's like a male dancer who has who they're always broke and it's just like one of these situations where it's like because other men are focused on money to get women and these guys get women without money they don't focus on money and then they end up later on in life not having like re, like you said before resisting business you you can take this too far right Oh yeah. I mean, and that's, that's what was happening. I was getting laid without money. Like I was broke, you know, I had nothing, but I had women, I had 14 girlfriends. And even when I was doing the promoting, I didn't have that much money. Um, it was enough to get by, but I didn't work any harder than that. I didn't invest it or do anything smart with it. I just spent it on going out and new clothes and, and hanging out with women and going on vacation with them. That was it. Um, it was only really as I got older that I really started learning this stuff. Um, but I know, like you said, a lot of guys that are still focused on women and, as weird as it sounds, I do think I had to get through an amount of women personally. I'm not saying everyone should, but personally, to get to a point where where I'm not motivated by them anymore. But yeah. there was definitely a few years in my life that you know I was just obsessed with understanding them and sleeping with them. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the people have asked me before. They're like, uh, "What what should come first? Like, try your relationships or your money?" And my whole thing is like, if you're living on a couch, bro, it's money. It's it's mm -hmm. it, the relationship stuff comes, but it's like if it's a situation where it's like. You're trying to get good with women, and then everything you're like literally trying to bootleg old RSD courses because you're so broke. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're trying to bootleg all these PDFs just so you can like learn some shit and watch YouTube videos, and yet you don't work work at all about like building some skill set in order to make money because you believe that literally game is going to carry you through. No, money is also important, not because you're trying to get women, but because as a man, you're going to have to perform for the rest of your life. So it, this is one of these situations that it gives you more options and makes your life easier. You do at some point need to focus on business or having a, a performance skill set that can get you some income. And it's not just about women, but it can partially be about women. But like, it's one of these things where I see guys, that's all they care about. They're like fucking 19 years old and they're like gonna drop out of college because they just wanna go chase women. And I'm like, bro, you're at an Ivy League school, chill. Like worry about this later, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's, it's just- be it's hard, right? People have impulse control and like, or they don't have impulse control, which is like one of the key factors. I always tell people it's like, um, there's a, a, a summarized simple version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where I'm like, if someone points a gun at your head, you're at level one, it doesn't really matter what you're going to do the rest of the week. You know, you just worry about the gun at your head. Um, and as long as you're not in immediate danger, you know, you're not on fire or anything, uh, then we go into level two, which is like, do you have food over, uh, you know, do you have food and do you have a roof over your head? And a lot of guys, they try to jump ahead. You know, they crash on someone's sofa while they're trying to get rich. I'm like, dude, just, you know, fix the immediate, you know, get your bills paid, get some food in you, you know, get your own place, which would, I'd consider level two. And then people are like, okay, well then I'm going to get rich to get girls. I'm like, no, but level three is relationships. So I'm like, you actually, that's a good point. To start working out your relationships, you know, get into game, get into dating, you know, don't give up your job, but, you know, you're, you're, you're doing okay. And then for me, I've always found that a good relationship is a catalyst to success. If you get level three down and your relationships are good, you can move into level four, which is where you have success. And that's a lot easier if you're building it with somebody. You know, we've seen this with power couples, right? You got, um, you know, Bezos, obviously, his relationship collapsed once Amazon was built. But, you know, he credits a lot of that initial growth to his wife. Well, at every point, et cetera, in the divorce. Uh, but, you know, that that's kind of that power couple thing is real. And I've often found that when you do have a partner that you get on well with, making level four is very, very easy, which brings you to sort of like stage five and beyond, um, which is kind of like, I find myself in more nowadays. Now, you know, now I do have millions uh, where you sit and you start thinking about, you know, higher level things, spirituality, helping other people, um, you know, what, what impact we make on the world. Um, and I think a lot of guys, if they realize that there is really an order to this, um, you know, focus on that order and everything's that much easier. Uh, I think, I think again, we're going back to the same thing before. I think the reason why your polyamorous relationship was different was because you consistently said this is, comes from a place of love and all three of us share uh, some responsibility in this relationship. And the same thing here, like, again, this industry, the seduction community, I'm not a dating coach, but like, I'm, I'm obviously familiar with a lot of the people in this community. Uh, the, the, the seduction community, there's two sides of it. Like you said, there is one side that is very, very much fueled by misogyny and hate. And then there's another side that it's like, 
I'm going to leave you better than I found you. Yes, I'm, I'm probably going to date a lot of women. I'm going to help your, this is women I'm friends with. I'll help your business. Like they, they, like it's one of these things where it's based on helping other people and love. And to some people, <laughs> you doing this makes you look like a simp. And it's really funny because these debates still go on even after all this time. And I, I'm still m baffled how some of these still, of these ideologies still exist. Uh, like misogyny isn't bad because I just love women and misogyny is not bad because I'm woke. Misogyny is bad because it's a bad game. It's just- I've got, I've got some, um, some good definitions that I, I've been thinking about recently for this. Cause obviously I, now I've like, I've gone on a few podcasts about dating again. Yeah. And I haven't done this for years, but I'm doing it mostly cause it's funny. Yeah. Um, and uh, because I was out of it for a while and you know, I, I'm not back into it. I just, my business is automated yeah. for the last five years. We've been making like a couple of million a year with the dating business just automated. Yeah. And I'm not really trying to grow it. I'm not evolving it. I'm just, I enjoy it. But I think that some people with experience who have done this for a long time, myself and a few others included, it is important that we come forward and remind people of the some key components. Like for example, this whole thing about like, you know, being a nice guy. Women don't want a nice guy. They want a great guy. You got to remember that. Being nice is a, is a minimum requirement. It's not going to get you anything. Being great, is what's going to separate you from other people. And being great means actually putting effort and time and energy into doing stuff that benefits others. Because we, as a species, are designed to look for people that help the group and not the self. Um, and that's a key component. And you can just watch the movie A Beautiful Mind if you need that to be explained to you again. There's a really good scene with a hot blonde. Um, that back in the day, in, when we were doing pickup, we all watched that video and we understood that if you just focus on the self, it's actually terrible and not good for game. But you have to do what's best for the group and the self. So and that's so, the, the key component. So you mentioned before about the bifurcation when there there was like a split, and then there's been several several controversies that's happened since then. The one with Elliot Rogers, the one with uh, Gunwich. Can you go into this like because you're getting? I mean, Adam, I'm gonna say, say something's gonna be controversial. I don't think you're a pickup artist. Uh, when I, my definition <laughs> of a pickup artist, they do not have female friends. They absolutely do not use social media for any. They think social media is for losers. Uh, they they do not believe in social circle whatsoever. That to me, that's what a pickup artist is. It is cold approach. And the only reason a girl didn't sleep with me is because I didn't game her well enough. That's that's to me. So when you when I hear somebody say you're a pickup artist and you're like, oh no, I make friends with tons of girls and walk into a club with 500. I'm like, that doesn't sound like a pickup artist. That sounds like a guy who's good with women. That sounds very different than a pickup artist. So. <laughs> So, so go ahead. Yeah, you're, you're right. And, but I came into this through the pickup world. Got it. And back then, 17 years ago, no one had done what I was doing. There wasn't anyone that had developed social circle. Like I came up with it. That was us. And so when we developed, you know, Project Entourage, which was our, it was kind of like a mirrored shadow to Project Hollywood, which was a whole bunch of dudes in a house. I was like, what if we had a whole bunch of women in a house? And that was like the, the shift. And when we developed that and it ended up, you know, being splintered and, and everyone had versions everywhere else, um, you know, but it came from the pickup world because that's how I got into it. Yeah. But I always told everyone, I was like, my method's different. I don't do what these other guys are doing, but I understand it. I know the lingo because I grew up in it and it just didn't work for me in the way that I think it didn't work for a lot of people. But what I do did work for me and I never really cared if it works for anyone else. It worked for me. Um, until we started developing a program because people paid us to do it and it works for them too. Can you, can you just talk about those controversies that we're talking about before the one with RSD, the one with, uh, like you said before, the, the, some of the violence that had happened, what do you, yeah. what do you, what do you attribute a lot of that to? So you know, Gunwich is a unique one. I never met, I never met Gunwich. Um, but he definitely threatened me a lot online with like wanting to kill me. Um, I, I remember, just because of my upbringing, I grew up in a really bad neighborhood with people that were trying to kill me all the time. So I'm just never scared or intimidated by that stuff. I'm just used to it. But I remember telling people at the time, man, you know what? The way he talks, he probably could one day. Like, he's that kind of guy. Um, and he's the reason that, you know, <laughs> not him specifically, but people like him are the reason that I, when I was younger, I did, you know, learn how to fight and and yeah, for sure. you know, and, and shoot guns and do all that good stuff when I came to America. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not afraid of it. But... Um, you know, it, there's, you know, the pickup industry definitely is a breeding ground for different types of people. And you're going to find in it what you want. Um, I, I always tell everyone, the pickup industry goes in cycles and we're in a shadow cycle right now, which is where the good pickup stuff isn't being spoken about. Only the, um, the bad stuff is being spoken about. And that happened previously before, which was like the dawn 
of when Neil Strauss came out with the game because it was the hidden society or the secret society of pickup artists. So we'll probably see in three or four years a new movement of it coming out again, maybe five years. Um, but right now it's underground. And so just like it was like in the 90s, where everyone favors good looks, muscles, and if you're not that kind of person, you can't get anyone, or well, that's like the belief by those that don't have that. Um, and so, you know, they've kind of forgotten the real stuff, which is what you're talking about, which is like having female friends and being a great person. So, um, you know, there have been a number of controversies that have led us to this point. So obviously uh, there was, um, you know, the situation with Gunnage. Um, there was the situation that I, I got very, very close to with uh, Julian Gate from RSD because yeah. uh, I was hired to help fix that scenario. So, so, so you were hired after the whole Julian thing happened? What, can you uh, I was hired in the middle of it in the middle because of it. it wasn't going away yeah and historically i'm the guy that people call in dating when they, they need help right so um i've been called by uh neil's called me up for something uh which i won't talk about um rsd called me up about julian gate and they said we need help we need this to go away and we don't know what to do um i got hired by uh, richard laruna um, when Super Seducer first came out, they wanted help with uh, with the video game and positioning in the media. And that's just because I have so much experience of business with all this kind of stuff at this point that people know to come to me for that stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, RSD came to me and they didn't know how to how to make it go away. And, you know, it it was a, a, a misunderstanding. It was a stupid misunderstanding, but it was a misunderstanding. Um, Julian edited a video to make himself look bad to prove you could manipulate the media. Mm. That was at least that's how it was described to me at the time. And um, I, they didn't get him to sign an NDA, so I feel comfortable saying that. But I mean, I drafted his apology that he said on CNN where he said that exact phrase again. So I, I don't feel bad saying it because that's the public statement that came out. Yeah. Um, you know, but that made it all disappear. And I, I think, you know, I remember Owen at the time was shocked that that went away so quickly. And I was like, yeah, they they just want a scapegoat right now. The media is looking for a scapegoat. Um, you know, we're in the dawn of the Me Too age back then, and they were looking for guys. I was like, and they've picked you because you guys are rising on social media and you have a very male-centric voice, which is not what people want to be hearing right now. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, there are many people that are anti-media and like being sensational, as Julian did at the time, but there are repercussions when you do things like that. Yeah. Always. And uh, those repercussions, you know, do involve things like, the equivalent of exile, which we now have as censorship, right? Is it digital exile essentially? Yeah. And uh, that was impacting RSD pretty badly. And then a few years later, they hired me to come on board and uh, you know tidy up the company. And so you know I, I helped them with their rebrand away from from all the controversial dates. So, so they, that was the other question I was going to ask you. So they they hired you because of the stuff. Got, I heard your uh, you know your podcast podcast where you were talking about like fifty percent of revenue going to ads and having six people in a C suite and the business mm -hmm. advice you were giving. That's why you ended up working with RSD. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I got hired for that, and you know, and many dating companies have hired me. In fact, um, you know, I, it was funny. I was writing something the other day. Um, I've been in charge at different points of uh, of coaching for PUA training, um, RSD, uh, for the Dow of Badass, for um, Pandora's Box, which mm. is uh, the Carla, um, and uh, and if I said, oh, uh, the Hero Company. Um, which is uh, 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 Jonathan Hudson um, and Christian Hudson, I think is the, the pen name. Um, there's another one, the Elixir of Eros, uh, which I was, um, I was that as well. So like, it's funny, uh, we used to, our sales company did the coaching for like five of the major dating companies in the world mm. at one point. And our head of sales used to have a phrase, which is um, all roads lead to me because all the phones rang to the same salesperson. Right. And we'd have people phone us up to do coaching not like the price, hang up, go through another company, end up back at the same salesperson. <laughs> wow. And they would answer the phone with, all roads lead to me, I uh, told you. Uh, because we were the only ones that got a successful enough hit rate without refunds that people, the, com the businesses wanted to work with us because our coaching is so automated and works yeah. that they could rely on it. Like if you did not want to manage a whole bunch of coaches and all the ego and everything, but you did want to make thousands of dollars per sale for a high-end coaching yeah we had a white label coaching service that we would rebrand your company and bring coaches in and do it and that's what i've been doing because i trained pua trainings team and i trained a lot of other teams uh, there was a, a a thing called project rockstar that i invented uh with my wingman back in the day which love systems ended up uh you know taking and and kicking me out of after i developed it but um you know i built a lot of these coaching programs and the ones that i developed tend to work so uh 
Okay, uh, what the the pivot that RSD took? What was it? So you threw a, a bunch of ideas at them, and then they chose to go into the trauma release area that they're in now. Like, what was what was the the origin behind that? Um, the origin was uh, when there was a trigger point. So um, I'm always monitoring for trigger points in 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 everything that I work in. The trigger point um, was when uh, I forget the guy's name now. Um, Info Wars. Uh, what was his, What was he called? Uh, uh, what, Alex Jones. Alex Jones. Uh, Alex Jones. When yeah. Alex Jones got removed off YouTube, mm -hmm. I had pinpointed a, a bunch of dating YouTube channels, and I was like, "If Alex Jones gets censored, I think these other dating channels go down." Yeah. And within 24 hours of Alex Jones being censored, I think it was 24 hours, 500 or 400 and something other YouTube channels went down, and some of them were dating channels. Yeah. So I then reached out to my own personal network of dating coaches that I'm friends with. And I was like, yo, you need to go and look at your content because of, of censorship. And so I'm like the behind the scenes guy that warns everybody. So I was like, you need to do this. So when I pinged Owen, I told Owen in advance this would happen before Alex Jones got censored. He goes, he'll never get censored. I was like, he's going to get censored. I'm, I'm very sure. And if he does, this is the potential repercussion we need to watch for. Yeah. So Owen phoned me. I was like, yo, you predicted it. Uh, and I'm actually, it's funny. I'm, I'm pretty good at predicting what's going to happen uh, in social trends just because of because of dating and business and stuff. So I, I predicted a few that I've got accurate uh, recently as well, which which we can come to another time. But anyway, um, so he started trusting my opinion on what was going to come next. And so, you know, I just started going through their content and being like, this could get you in trouble. This could get you in trouble. And he never asked me what they should pivot to. But I was like, you need to pivot away from this. Mm. You know, what you go to is up to you, you know? Um, and so I, they brought me on for like four or five months and I went through as a, you know, the, the head of coaching and uh, a business consultant and we just cleaned up all their content and they started creating new stuff. It's crazy. I get this question all the time about what happened with RSD. I, I see it on message board. What happened with RSD? So this is the first time I've actually heard like a technical, you know, from it's a, me. Uh, yeah, I, I happen an executive, an executive <laughs> level decision on exactly what happened there. I get that question, uh, uh, often, uh, back yeah. to what we were saying before. Cause I, I, I love this cause you were building a business saying you were the anti pickup artist, pickup artist at one point. Yeah. Right. And so I, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, was this a situation where you were seeing people having not success with other programs? And then was this a, a, like a, an actual business strategy that you were doing? Was it effective? Was it an effective business strategy? Yeah, I had no business strategy back then. That was okay. the problem. So yeah, I had no skills. I just, I just knew that when I, because I did this for me, like I said, I wanted to learn. Like look, between you and me, before I got into dating, um, I was so depressed that women didn't like me, which is why I resonate. And I do understand like, you know, insults. I wanted to kill myself. I was like, I'm done. Like that night I was just going to end my life. And um, it, as stupid as it sounds, I decided, okay, this is it. I'm ending my life. But there was one book I hadn't read on my library and it was the game by Neil Strauss. And I was like, I don't know if I can kill myself not having read the game because it was a gift from a friend. So maybe that was a survival mechanism of my own brain, you know, like knowing what I know about psychology, whatever it was, I read the book and halfway through the book, I'm a speed reader. So I read like half the book in a night mm. and halfway through the book, I was like, and I had nothing else to do. Um, I was like, I'm going to test this out. And so I signed up for a boot camp, mm. and it was terrible and it didn't work. Who was at the boot camp? Who's, who's at the boot camp? Time for a cat nap, James DeMarco and Thomas Westenholt. Okay. That's how old this is. And this is what I'm saying. Like when I'm like, That's yo, crazy. I did this 17 years ago. Like the guys I trained with, it's like the, the websites they posted on don't even exist anymore. The forums don't exist anymore. Yeah. This is old school, old school. It's funny because I go into things, everyone's like, I teach social game. And I'm like, yo, I invented that. Like I wrote the, the script on that 17 years ago. And people laughed at me and said, no, cold approach is the only thing, you know? Um, but they were the coaches and um, it didn't work. It was really bad. But it was clear they could get women and they weren't hot. And I was like, these guys are broke, ugly, overweight, and they're picking up chicks. And the women are hot. You know, at least objectively to me at the time, they were hot. I was like, I need to do something. But what they said didn't work. So I started analyzing them and realized I just wanted to be as close to them as possible to learn. Yeah. So I just started like paying for everything I could, borrowing money, mm. um, you know, just hanging out with them every spare minute. If they needed an assistant, I was the assistant. Um, you know, they need someone needed a place to crash. You get my place. You know, I became that guy. Like, whatever you need, whatever you need. I just want to watch and learn. Yeah. 
And that's when I started piecing together that they weren't teaching what they were doing. And some of the stuff they did was a guess and a gamble and it didn't always work. And then I got systematic about it. I was like, I'm going to stand on the street corners of London. I'm going to practice all day, every day. I did eight hours a day, seven days a week. I was outside, finish work, stand on the street corner, practice for six hours to two hours in the morning before work, all day, every day for almost two years. That's crazy. And that's how I got good. And even when I got good, I kept doing it. And I analyzed, does this work? Does that work? Does this work? Does that work? Does it? And I, I would like be like, I'm going to test these 12 lines. And I'm just going to do that so every day this you're week. AB you're A-B testing Dude, different, I different A-B technology. Testing yeah. Everything. Yeah. And that's how I got good. So to me, it's not a gamble or a guess. I know. And so it was funny. I'd have people arguing me. I'm like, you can argue, but did you speak to 200 women yesterday? Yeah. Because I did. And guys like, you can't find 200 women. Go to Piccadilly Circus in London. Tell me you can't find 200 women yeah. practicing. You can find 200 women easy. And that's what I did. I stood in Piccadilly Circus and trained and trained and trained. And if I ran out of women at Piccadilly Circus, which would happen because I talked so many, I'd move to Leicester Square and do the same thing, you know, which is like a short walk. Yeah, I went to Piccadilly Circus. I, went, I took a bunch of girls. We went to uh, with Paradise Challenge to Ibiza. And then we went to London for a little while afterwards. And I'm walking nice. through Piccadilly Circus. And you know what, bro? I'm just looking for PUAs. The whole time I'm there, I'm just like, where are they? They're all, like, I even told some girls, like, hey, walk with me through here. And I want to see if some dudes come up and start saying creepy shit to you. Come on, let's go check it out because I, I had heard i had heard like this is like the alley like this is like hallowed pickup ground is piccadilly circus so i wanted to go over there and check it out i uh i had a similar experience i worked with mystery uh for two years uh and and and, and those guys love dropping those guys in uh, matador mm. and it was not it was a situation where it worked or didn't work it was a situation where okay i did this and then i lived in atlanta and i just only focused on dudes who were incredible at building networks and unbelievable mm-hmm. with women and i only copied what they did and i stopped listening to puas that was the main yeah. thing and that's not that i didn't like those guys or that i didn't <laughs> respect them it was just like from this point forward i'm only interested in in, in like learning bodybuilding from the guy who's bigger than me i'm only interested in learning dating from guys who are better than me i'm only interested in learning business from guys who richer than me, not from guys on message boards. And that that change for me, probably 2009, 2010, was like a huge, huge difference for me. Like you said before, I was coaching for 14 years for free before I had ever like even considered making money. And and now like, you know, the first year, the first month we came out, we were doing six figures and a 40% close rate because it was one of these situations where it's like I was only concerned with what worked only concerned with what worked. No, no consideration whatsoever to things that don't work, but it's not a dating coach. You know, I, I, it's not a dating company. I have a, it's a networking status company that I, that I teach, but it's really interesting nice. because so many of the things that you came to the realization of, especially the one about female friends. Now, can you go over this? Because, you know, we, we briefly talked about this, uh, pre-selection, uh, for me, pre-selection was a situation where I was in Atlanta. There's this company called uh, Armada Magazine. Make, shout out to Max Smith if he's a, if you're watching this. These guys would go. They were club promoters, and they would like look like anime characters with their spiky hair, and they would go to clubs with Ed Hardy t-shirts on back then in that day <clears throat> with the fucking wristbands. None of them knew fuck all about pickup, and they were fantastic with women. And then I would go to L.A., and I would see these club promoters. They would be dressed all in black, and they never looked like they were happy or whatever, and they'd be just like surrounded by a bunch of women. And I would always like pay attention. What's going on here? What's working? What's not working? And one of the things that I noticed is these guys all had the capability of being friends with women, right? And I personally enjoyed being friends with women because I managed a strip club and I found that it was just much more enjoyable to have interesting people to talk to. Yeah, which is great environment, right? Yes. To, to learn that stuff. Yeah, and you know, um, so for me, pre-selection, I, I sort of discovered it by accident. Um, I was trying to pick up the hottest chicks in the bar and I just kept failing. And I decided it, just like I did with dating, if I was going to learn this, I need to hang out with them. So I went up to the hottest girls in the club and was like, yo, um, you know, I, I'm trying to learn how to meet and attract women. And um, you guys are the hottest girls here. Every, <laughs> every guy Genius. I know Genius. that knows how to pick up women can't pick up women like you. Yeah. Is it cool if I hang out with you guys and just yeah. see what guys do and, uh, you know, see if I can learn anything? And the women were like, that's hysterical. Sure. And I was like, I'll buy you drinks or whatever, you know. And they're like, you don't need to. We get free drinks. And I didn't know they got free drinks. I was like, what? You don't? You know, I didn't know, you know. Because I offered to buy them drinks. And um, that was how I met them. And I used to just hang out with like 10 women. And the minute I did that, women started approaching me and trying to hit on me. Yeah. And I was like, what is going on? It was crazy. So I started looking into it. Um, and I found a study uh, by Benedict Jones. Mm. Uh, did the study, if you want. And that's the study into pre-selection. And it was known about before, but Benedict Jones is the one that did like the f- photograph test I was talking about earlier. And um, and that's when I realized, I was like, oh, damn. Like, 
and it came out in like 2006. So it was quite fresh at the time. Uh, have you uh, seen, have you seen the other studies with other vertebrate mammals and not, not just mammals, it's actually uh, uh, birds too. They do this with mm -hmm. other vertebrates and they, they show the, the male in any two gender vertebrate, whenever they show the male with more females around him, even when these females were stuffed fucking animals, that they would get selected more. It was just a really, really fascinating thing. There's three, uh, there's three, I'm sorry, there's 5,000 different mammals on the planet. Only 3% of them pair bond. But the whole pre-selection thing, and by the way, the term, if you ever wonder, you know, Dr. Buss calls it, it is the mate copying strategy. He does not call it pre-selection. That is the actual right. psychological term for it. It's called mate copying strategy. Um, that whole thing, it was, it was the most true thing I'd ever seen in my life. It was like gravity. And after a while, one of the things that I love uh, about, you know, I'm friends with Dan Bilzerian and he, he would, st he, he would talk about being with, you know, 30, 40, a hundred girls at once that would be at his house. He'd be dating them or whatever. And I was like, it, was there an end point? It was there a point where there were so many women that women stopped being attracted to you. And there was not, that was like one of the main things is like he had taken this, this idea to its nth degree, to its furthest level. And that, that was one of the things where I was like, uh, I was like, what, what, how, what do you think about pre-selection? He doesn't call it pre-selection, just like being with hot girls. What do you think about this? Like, where does this rank? And he goes, well, fame would be number one. And then being with hot girls would be number two. And then like money would be number three. And it was just really interesting thing, seeing it from his point of view and other people's point of view uh, about how pre-selection worked. And then, then from my standpoint, you know, the women that I would date were so far out of my league and it was so confusing to some of my friends. And I was like, yes, it's because my kindly Myers is my wingman. And she's one of the biggest models in the world it's because CJ Sparks yeah. is my wingman. She's one of the biggest models <laughs> in the world. That's the reason why they would just go up. I would say nothing and then everything would work out. And it was so confusing for a lot of people when they saw that, but to, to realistically, you could build an entire social circle based on pre-selection and nothing else and still be a fucking weird dude. And it would work, but you, there's all these other things that you can, uh, that you can approve of. Anyway, you're, you're, your personal discoveries about pre-selection. Yeah, and it was it was wild to see, but I, I, I love your story because I would see that in the clubs as well. Like you're going out four nights a week, you see scenarios. I remember seeing this like short, ugly guy surrounded by like when yes. he was like missing teeth and balding, you know, like he was ugly. He wore suits that like looked like a granddad suit or something out of like Night of the Living Dead. It, it was so bad. And, and women were all over him. And I remember thinking, damn, pre-selection's the thing. Have you, like, have you, there is nothing better. Have you ever seen the guy who, he may be gay, he may not be gay, but he acts like he is gay. He's surrounded by a bunch of women and women still go home with him. Have you seen that before? Oh, dude, hundreds, yeah, of course. Hundreds of times I've seen that happen before. Yeah, or, or how about like the retired promoter in his 50s yeah. who, who looks like he's really out of place yeah. and you know should have grandkids, but the women are all over him. Yeah. Be because you know pre-selection is... Is like, I mean, like, just look at um, Ron Jeremy. Yeah. Well, Ron don't look Jeremy. at don't look at him now. He's in prison, but yes. Right, but like, no, but that's the point. Like that guy, at no point was he ever <laughs> physically attractive. Yeah. Or rich, or in shape. Yeah. And yet, women were, and people were like, "Yeah, but he paid them." No, he didn't. He didn't need to pay most of them, and somebody else paid them. What? So I, I remember I would just like, I suppose like where other guys latch on to that and try and find excuse, I would latch on to it and be like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. You know, and that was that was kind of like my thing. Um, and I just really wanted to like understand it. And and pre-selection is so powerful. To me, like I said, it's it's three key components, which is pre-selection, confidence, which we describe as experience, not confidence. Mm. The more, the more you do something the more confident you get with it, right? That's why we, that's why, you know, in the military, you drill shooting over and over again. So you're yeah. confident with a gun. It's, this, it's the same thing. You probably never lost respect for guns, maybe built more respect. I don't know, I'm not in the military, yeah. but I'm guessing. But but you may have, maybe you didn't, but you may have been scared of guns, but the more you use them, you don't get scared of them, you respect them. And, yeah. and you become confident and experienced with them. And that's confidence. And that was a big one for me. Could everyone be like, just be confident, bro? Like, Fuck his confidence. How do I be confident? Do you mean fake it? But no, it just means experience. And then the last one is escalation. Like you got to know how to turn a woman on. And guys don't. And guys think that it's all about them and that the woman doesn't exist. And, you know, porn to, to some degree um, facilitates that because, you know, well, I think it's ends. I think it's more than some degree, bro. I think it's a massive degree well, where guys yeah, literally it's zero or a hundred, and they fucking just, they ruin everything, dude. Physical <laughs> escalation in a nightclub, like guys are so 
fucking clueless when it comes to this. And, and, the, and the guys who teach this stuff, it's like, like again, she is not interested in you because of your intent. She's interested in you because of your status. And the, the thing is, like, part of your status is your experience, like you said before. And part of your status is your pre-selection. And part of your status is your confidence. And, they, and like, there are guys literally that are out there that are just like, man to woman, insta-fuck, spit her around, show her your dick. And I'm like, bro, chill out. Like, you're going to go to jail. You're going to go to jail with some of this advice, pimp. Like, what are you doing? I know the guy. I know the guy. You know exactly. You know who he is. You know spit around <laughs> Insta fuck guy, don't you? You know who uh, I'm fucking. You know I stay. This yeah. motherfucker stayed at my house. He was spinning around insta, <laughs> insta fuck. I'm I, like, bro, chill. I'm not gonna name names, yes. but I am gonna say one time I got invited to teach in Korea, and uh, and insta fuck guy was there. Yeah, and and I, I know insta fuck guy, but um, I I've made fun of insta fuck guy in videos before that went viral. Yeah, and and so he's like, you know, there's there's friendly animosity between the two of us. Yeah, well, we turn up and um. I always bring women with me to my pickup events. Like always, if I'm teaching dating, I'll bring women there. And he didn't bring any women. Yeah. And so we're in this seminar, like a hundred people and I'm the only one with women. And he goes, Hey, uh, can I, uh, can I practice with some of your women on stage? I want to do a demonstration. And I was like, uh, you can ask them. They're going to say no. Yeah. And uh, he goes, well, I want to ask. So he goes up to them and asks them and they're like, no. And then he's like, well, now what do I do? I was like, ask one of the guys in the audience. So there is video out there somewhere of him demonstrating insta fuck on a dude. Yo, and I'm it's not somewhere. It's very easy to find. It's all over the internet. I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. That shit was crazy. Dude, I used to do the same thing, man. I would walk into, because again, like I was not, I did not teach pickup, but I went out every night in Los Angeles. Guess who goes out every night in Los Angeles? PUA. And I would see them. Yeah. And I was like, hey guys, can I show you how to get into this nightclub so we don't go to fucking bungalow every night? Come on, can we do something else? And I was and I would sit there and just like, uh, these are some female friends. I remember walking into some of these events and I'd have six or seven girls with me and then everyone would get quiet. And I'm like, motherfucker, don't get quiet. There's nothing you should be saying in here right now that you would not say in front of women. Listen to anybody in here who's in the seduction community, I will say this right motherfucking now. Any of you, if you're saying shit with your guy friends that you would not say in front of women, it's probably wrong. It, yeah, what you're absolutely. doing, is, it's no, I mean, it's probably incorrect shit. If yeah, what you're absolutely. saying cannot stand up, <laughs> if I bring, I, 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 come on my Monday calls, I will, put, I will put seven or eight playmates on there. When those seven or if you are afraid to say what you're trying to say in front of those playmates, just go ahead and drop whatever you're going to say because it doesn't work. Everything I say on this podcast and everything I say on my calls, I do it. I can do it in front of women because it's not fucking wrong. That's the reason why I'm not afraid to say it. Dude, I have a seminar called How to Get a Beggy to Fuck Her in the Ass. Oh, no. And oh, no. I, oh, yeah. And we, I was we might have to blank that one out. We might get that in trouble. That might get YouTube struck. I was, uh, <laughs> I was live in, uh, in Florida. And I said this at this speech, I was teaching in a hotel and two women walked in, yeah. random women walked in. And I would just finish saying that I'm so proud of this seminar. It works so well. Women agree with me. And these random chicks walk in and they're like, damn, this sounds interesting. And they've got like their arms folded, you know, and all the guys, like 50 dudes in this seminar, they look at me and they're like, there's no way Adam's going to keep teaching. And I just said to the women, I was like, hey, I'm proud of the fact I can say everything in this seminar and I'm not going to upset one of you. And I would, I actually welcome you to tell me if I've got this right. Thank Is you. This what it would take to get you to beg for it. And they go, well, we'll see about that. You know, so I teach the whole seminar. And at the end, every guy turns around, looks at the two women. They go, yeah, that would work. That's and, that, and that's the, so I agree. I agree hundred percent. I don't just believe it. I stand by it. You know, like that is, that is the benchmark. If you cannot teach what you're saying in front of a woman, it is wrong. There's no question about that. You know, there are, there is a way to get a woman to want to do anything. It's not manipulation. Well, well, let's even you back have to give them what they want. Let's even back up. Even if they disagree, the fact that you can't teach it in front of a woman says more about you. The fact that you, what you're teaching, you believe to be this hidden little sniveling fucking Ugh. echo chamber of hate and misogyny. No, motherfucker. I will teach in front of anyone because what I'm saying is the truth. What I'm saying, not only have I seen it work, it is backed up by science. It is backed up by Leah Cosmides and Cindy Meston, by Steven Pinker and David Buss. That's why I teach what I teach. It is not because of, even because of my opinion, it is, it is because it is the truth. Therefore, I do not have any problem saying what I'm saying in front of men or in front of women. That's, that's the reason why. And it's so, dude, I've seen it before where guys are like teaching a, a pickup course or cold approach and a girl walks in 
and they just shut the fuck up. Like, never. If you are one of these dudes and you do this, stop that shit now. Stop it. Because, because what you're doing is, it's, I'm not saying it's wrong morally. I'm saying what you're teaching is probably wrong if you can't say it in front of women. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think in general, you know, even from a moral point of view, if you're not confident enough in what you're saying, that you're not willing to say it in front of the people that you're planning on using it with, something's wrong there internally in you. Yeah. Right? Like, I, I, if I'm going to do something, like, I have this thing I call brutal honesty. Like, I'm just going to say it to you as it is. Like, I always, I always talk about this. Like, I don't talk bad about people behind their back. Um, you know, I, rule, I'll Rule say number it. five. Rule number five, bro. That is rule number five of my program. We do not talk bad about people behind their back. Yeah. I will say it you to can, your face. Yeah, you can phone me. I'll, I'll tell you because, yeah. like, I have no problem. And that's why, like, you know, the things, even on this podcast, I've said, like, yeah, this I feel very comfortable saying. It's public. It's public information. Yeah. And even though I don't have an NDA, there are just things I just – wouldn't release on behalf of somebody because that's the other part. I'm not going to tell somebody else's secret, right? Like yeah. I'm, there's, there's a, there's, there's a level of just integrity to who you are. And I don't follow somebody else's code. I've got my own, I follow and, and I stick to that. And because all my decisions are based by my own code, I'm in agreement with myself. And I know that I don't try and hurt people. I know that, you know, I'm a good guy. And part of that is I teach my dating stuff in front of women and welcome their feedback. Um, you know, uh, I, it's actually funny because we were talking before we started about, you know, David Booth and, um, you know, who, who I got my psychological studies from, which is uh, Dr. Loretta Brennan. Yeah. And um, she was, uh, you know, one of the professors of psychology at the University of Oakland in California. And I hired her for private coaching and studied under her for days when I was building the ACE formula because I wanted to make sure that what I was teaching was accurate because we use biochemistry. And I was like, I don't have a... Uh, a biochemistry degree although fun fact i'm about to graduate uh my degree in psychology uh, which i'm pretty excited about so i should have that in a few months now um I can, and which is i'm doing it backwards i'm gonna go and get all the, yeah, the, for sure. the grades now but it's really funny i'm just getting a a a because i know it all i've known i've yeah. known it all for a long time but uh but i didn't have the qualification right but um th i felt confident releasing my content after hiring a professor because i sat down with her and showed her it and said please critique everything like, am I right? Am I wrong? Treat this like a grade paper. And she went through my whole formula and was like, yep, this is right. This is wrong. You should tweak this. You know, and I, I, I tweaked it. Um, but what I love about that is my, my teaching was graded by a woman. Yeah. And I feel very confident that all the stuff I wrote about sexual escalation, anal sex, everything, a woman, a professor of psychology at university said yeah that's correct and accurate and good just so just so we're clear i'm not saying that like if you know he's not saying the same thing it's not like our entire belief system is based on what women told us well the thing is we're not ashamed to say it in front of women this is the big delineation and by the way i know there's a lot of guys out there that are like well women don't understand what they're attracted to what they say they're attracted to and what they're attracted to are two different things so you're saying that some women are self un, not self-aware well guess what there are men out there who are simps there are men who are, who are also not self-aware. The point is not about men or women. The point is you're self-aware or you're not self-aware. I'm sure you've talked to women before that are like, I keep fucking the bad guy. I keep going back to my ex and I'm addicted to toxic behavior. When I hear a woman who's self-aware like that, I will listen to her. Like she, because she's self-aware. When I listen to a woman, it's like, no, I believe in the Disney fairy tale. And because of my Sagittarius, because I'm a, I'm a Sagittarius, I deserve this soulmate to show up on this date because God is going to send me a soulmate and I deserve it because I watched Cinderella. <laughs> this is not a woman I would take advice from. It's just very clear. It's like one of them is self-aware and one of them is not self-aware, but it doesn't matter their gender. Their gender is not part of this point. Yeah, it, I, exactly. And I think, and I think, you know, more to your point, when we're teaching and there's a woman in the room, I don't need her to... Um, to verbally um, confirm that that which I'm teaching is correct. I'm just looking to see if she's resonating with yes, it. Yes, correct. You know, and but also if I teach something, it's not like I'm I'm asking a random woman, hey, teach me your criteria so I can share it with these dudes. That's not what's happening. What's happening is I've done my own research, got the experience, trained people, learned it, analyzed it, used it, tested it, then got it refined by a psychologist, a professor then teach it in front of women and women are like, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. That's it. I didn't need their validation. Getting the validation is great, but I don't have women listen to it and say that wouldn't work on me. Or, or, or the other thing I, I hear a lot is, oh, I never thought of it like that. Oh, I didn't yeah. like a lot of times it's, it's the, it's the one where I talk a lot about uh, testosterone where men have, might have 1100 testosterone, a woman might have 40 and it's like, whoa, do, men don't need comfort in order to have sex. And she's like, oh, I didn't think of it like that. Like maybe it's the first time that, that she'd ever heard that. And yeah. so a lot of times it's a discovery. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, 
uh, we did a we did a customer insight report, which is what a lot of our, our business stuff is now. And in the customer insight report, uh, we studied about what women want in a man as the number one factor, yeah. right? Um, what a woman wants. And um, I, while writing the report, guessed one thing. After 17 years of talking to women, I was like, I, I, I'm going to guess something. Well, out of all the things that we listed, money, you know, comedy, um, you know, a, a, a nice guy, Prince Charming, like we listed everything. My answer got 75% of the yeses. Mm. That's my ideal thing. And the woman that we did the study for, she was blown away that I guessed it and that, that I nailed it. It was 75%. And then she was like, well, 17 years of dating, you should get it. What's fascinating, I'm, obviously I'm going to reveal it to everyone in a second, but 75% of women in this survey out of thousands of women chose and said, yeah, that is my number one quality in a man. And um, and I've never heard it before outside of this one survey that we did. Now, yes, it was only done on Americans. Um, and, you know, so, you know, they lean um, center. They're not like right or left. So, you know, there's all sorts of things that could be wrong. This isn't a, an official um, study for psychology, but it is a marketing study that will actually and has already been used and proven uh, to grow a business because that's what we used it for. Um, but what I find fascinating is I was at a bar a week ago in San Diego and there was another woman there and I told her this story and she said, I am purposely going to disagree with what you say <laughs> before I said it. Yeah. And I said, okay, I'm going to say it. And I was like, and she's like, yep, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, you're wrong. She goes, because I'm a contrarian and I want you to be wrong. You're wrong. And I was like, all right, that's fine. She goes, what is it? And this is it. A man that makes her feel like a woman should feel. And there's a lot in that phrase. Yeah. A lot. It's not treat her badly. It's not treat her like a second rate citizen. It's not tell her what to do. Make her feel like a woman should. And um, the woman looked at me and said, I'm very annoyed that I don't disagree with that, <laughs> right? uh, which, which, made me, which made me laugh. But, uh, you know, from a marketing point of view, it's a massive win for us. Uh, they got 40% uh, more, more signups mm. than they'd ever had before. So it was, it was a real win. But it, I loved it because it popped in my head while we were doing the survey. And I'd never thought of it before. I'd never written it down before. I'd never read it anywhere. But my brain was like, this is what they want. And the more I looked at it, I was like, that is what they want. Because when a woman, when you make a woman laugh, she acts like her teenage self yeah. or like when she was a kid, you know, I have a four-year-old daughter and I see that same laughter in my daughter that I see in, in a woman when I know I've got attraction. It's that same like belly giggled, like, you know, the snort laugh, like the real one, you know? And uh, it's not the like, ha, ha, ha. it's like the real, the real laugh. And, um, you know, and, and the more I think about it, when I make food and, and I provide a woman with food, which is triggering provider, by the way, for anyone who cares, um, you know, you can, you know, they, they get that eyes roll back orgasmic look in their face. Like, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. When, when you're, you're having sex with her and she's in surrender, orgasmic surrender, right. And she's orgasming on your dick. She's like, um, she's getting that feeling inside her where she's, you know, completely convulsing, like her whole body's like going and, and going again. And in each one of these things, she is being a submissive woman. In, in giving herself, giving in to all of her impulses, which is what she wants to be able to do. But in order for her to do that, she's got to know that she's safe, cared for, looked after, um, that you're confident, you know what you're doing, um, that she's not going to have to worry about paying bills tomorrow. There's a whole bunch of things that, that go on in a woman's head for her to be in that complete surrender, to be like, yeah, I'm okay to let myself go with this guy. I love it. I love it. And and I think that's the piece that most guys are missing. That's why we can't say it's a thing, right? Because like, yeah, a taller guy can pick her up and make her feel can make her feel like that. Because I know this because like my taller girlfriend, she says to me, the one thing I don't like about dating you, she goes, is you don't pick me up because I'm so big. And she's like, you know, it's not, she's big, she's slim, she's tall. She goes, um, and like, that's something that I don't get with you. And I was like, yeah, that sucks. Sorry. Um, and she's like, it's fine. But I, I recognize in that moment, that's one thing I'm failing at for her that I can't do because I'm sh shorter than she is but it's not enough for her to be like okay I'm out she's not gonna leave all the other things where I make her feel like a woman should to get that one thing from somebody else but if I started dropping all these other things and not doing it, yeah 
then they would build up and suddenly I would not be making her feel like a woman should. And I would be making her feel like she's got to be in charge and she's got to make decisions and she's got to fix the things that I'm not fixing and take care of the shit that I'm not taking care of. And then the attraction disappears. You know what? It's interesting you say that because we talk about this on this podcast a lot where uh, you, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever played FIFA or Madden or any of those sports video games like 2K yeah. or MLB the show, there's sliders, right? Power, 99, speed, 96. There's like these different attributes that they have. And I talk to this with my, with my clients. I'm like, we need all of these to at least be an 80. And if we can work on them, let's get them to a 90. A couple of people, like say Mark Zuckerberg, money, we'll give him a 99, right? Intelligence, we'll give him a 99. Like grooming, like style, we're going to give him a 50, right? He, yeah. he doesn't have all of his sliders up to 80. He doesn't. And so that's the thing. We should be able to do all these things. And then when you do, then you can provide comfort. I always tell guys this, man. It's so it, it, you'll, you'll probably relate to this. Like, okay, just be, pretend you're a girl. Okay. Still you're a heterosexual dude. Pretend you're a girl. Someone is going to put a dick in you. Ugh, ugh. Someone's going to put a penis in you. How fucking perfect would they have to be? How, how much would, how good would you have to feel before a motherfucker put a penis inside of you? Right. And they're like, no, you just think you're going to be a fucking slobbing motherfucker with messed up teeth and go up and just grab her inappropriately. Oh, of course God. she doesn't want to have sex with you, bro. Just imagine what that experience must. Oh God. Again, no, the, the, no That's shame cool. to any of my, my clients who are homosexual. That's not it. Obviously for you, it would be a different experience. But for me, yeah, as a man, I'm like, I'm trying to re relate uh, you know, the reason why when I have a threesome, we don't invite another guys because guys are gross. They're fucking gross. And I don't want another penis in the room because uh, uh. so, so that's the whole thing. Right. So when I say that, when I say that to dudes, I'm like, now just imagine you're a woman like that. How high would your standards have to be? You guys want a short term sexual partner with some playboy model and she has a choice of any dude she wants and she's going to pick you motherfucker. Why is she going to pick you? Cause the way you make your, make her feel. Because your sliders are all the way up to 80 or 90 or 99 in some cases. Those sliders, those attributes are up there. But you can't have all these. He's good looking. He's rich. He's tall. And his breath smells like fucking gross ass like sulfur. <laughs> no, man. It's, funny it's not going to work. It's, it's funny what you talk about the sliders. We have a, a similar thing. We have like the 10 attributes. I was yeah. about and we, yeah. people, we score you one 10 on each one. Right? Yeah. So you get a score of 100. It's 100%. And the goal is to get as close to it as possible. What I always tell people is like, especially like around like provider, that's one of our qualities, which we cover. It's it's not just money. Provider also is, you know, can you cook? Because yeah. that's a big factor. If you can't cook, then you're going to be paying for takeout every night. And that's expensive. Hey, so hey, red, hello, money, red, red pill guys are giving us a thumb di thumbs down on the video right now. Keep going. Keep going about the provider yeah, stuff. But, yeah. Right. But, but it, it's, it's hysterical because like for me, when I couldn't afford to pay for dinner you know i would cook all the time and i got so good at cooking i actually hid the fact that i could cook until uh, until 2020 covid yeah um because we would always eat out because we had the money and my 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 now fiance um during covid she broke down in tears i was like babe what's up and she goes i miss eating out because she started cooking yeah. and um and i was like what do you miss about it she goes i miss the quality of food and she's like i just can't cook like that i feel bad i'm not providing you know and i heard provide in my head and I was like, damn, like she thinks she's the provider now because she's cooking every day. Mm. And it tripped that like old school game part of my head that was like, that's not okay. Especially when I know how good of a cook I am. And so I said, don't cry. Let me cook dinner. And, uh, and I cooked like grilled lobster on a truffle risotto with a, a side of like caramelized zucchini, I think. And she was just awestruck. And she's like, how do you cook like this? I was like, well, this used to be my game when I was broke. I used to, I used to cook. <laughs> I'm really good at cooking. And, and so I've been cooking ever since then. So since 2020, I've cooked every meal because now we've both got used to eating really good food. And, and even what we cook is better than a lot of what we get you know, out. You know, It compares to, to the high-end restaurants. And it's easier because we live an hour and a half away from many things. So it's easier to just cook than it is to drive for three hours, which is what we used to do. Um, but but that that factor, that slider thing you're talking about, we have that as well. But I always tell people, it's you don't like a lot of people think, well, to be a 10, I've got to be Zuckerberg rich. Or, you know, to be a 10 in physique, I've got to be a bodybuilder. And I was like, you really don't have to be. You just have to be full. And I give an example, I'm like, um, it's like having a bucket of water. Yeah. If you've got a bucket of water, how full is the bucket? Is it 100% full? Because that's not the most efficient full bucket, is it? Because when it's 100% full, it, it drips out. You're losing water. Yeah. If that was liquid gold, we wouldn't want to lose a single drop. So filling it to the top would be dumb. How? There isn't a, 
an efficiency to a full bucket. Yeah. But like like you said, we don't want it 50% either because that's also a waste. So you don't have to be the best of the best. You just have to be good. Or like I said earlier, women don't want a nice guy. They want a great guy. Yeah. So you just have to be you know better than most. And from a financial perspective, it actually isn't about how much money you have. It's about how much disposable money you have. And it isn't really even about that. It's about how much freedom do you have? Mm. Because really, wealth is a means to buy freedom. And as I coach, you know, multi-million dollar businesses in how to grow and scale, um, we recognize that cash is bad. You don't really want cash lying around. You get taxed on it. it it's actually better to have um, you know, assets. Um, but those assets are wealth building for the future, but not today which is why you'll often have a scenario where like, like my, my newest car and buying myself is like half a million bucks, but buying it in cash would be stupid because I'd pay a lot of tax on that. And there are other ways to buy it where I don't have to pay tax on. It. So, um, and it's not because I'm avoiding tax. It's just because I've decided to borrow money because you don't pay tax on money. You borrow, mm. you pay interest instead. Um, but then, there are ways that you can be smart with interest. And so once you start thinking about things like that, you realize that the true wealthy don't have tons and tons of cash that they're spending. They're just smart with the money they've got. Yeah. So likewise, I'll have students like, well, how much money extra do I, I need? And I'm like, actually, as long as you can afford to eat out once or twice a week, and as long as you can afford the roof over your head and you've got more than enough space for everyone, and as long as your car isn't falling apart and you know it's quite nice, as long as you go vacation a couple of times a year, you're probably good. Yeah, You probably have a full bucket. It, it's more than enough. But if every time you go and eat out, you say to her, oh, don't get the steak, that's expensive. Or if every time you go shopping, you say to her, your budget's 100 bucks, don't spend more. Now you have a problem. So it's about having enough money, but also dating somebody that is providing things too. Because you don't want to be in a situation where you're just paying for the other person for everything and they're not doing anything. In that situation, they should also be providing and helping with this whole scenario. And for the average guy, that's why you don't need to be really, really rich. You just need to, you know, you, you can make 50 grand a year, providing you're not living like you're making 100 grand a year. Yeah. Because now you're going to have problems. But you can make 50 grand a year, your partner can make 50 grand a year. And you guys can live in a pretty nice house and you can have a really good life. But remember that you got to go on dates, you got to go on vacations, you got to do all this other stuff. And if you don't do that because of money, your relationship will collapse pretty fast. I love it. You, you ever have a, when you were a promoter, do you ever have somebody hit you up and they were like, hey man, bring your girls to this. And I'm like, bro, they're not my girls. Like I don't not, slavery was outlawed January 1st, 18, unless you're in Texas, then it was June 19th, 1865. Uh, but that, that slavery was outlawed. I don't own anybody. And it's really difficult. I say, I say this to my guy friends all the time. Don't ever go through her phone. Just fuck her better. Like this is one of these situations where I don't own anybody. And like what you said before, it just gets to one of these situations where like, one of the, when I moved to Vegas, one of the things I wanted to do was see, hey, how can I build a social circle without treating women like cattle? Because everyone I saw here was treating women like cattle. I would yeah. see guys leading groups of atmosphere models and just calling them whores to their face. And I was like, dude, this is like, not only is this wrong, not only is this ineffective, but like, I couldn't sleep with myself. I couldn't go to bed at night saying like this to another human being and hating someone, even if, the, even if a woman had chosen to become a prostitute for me to be, like denigrate her like that for no fucking reason. Cause I don't know what happened in her life. Dude, a lot of people don't end up doing porn or in prostitute, becoming prostitutes because they came from affluent backgrounds. You don't know what kind of shit happened in their life. So to be that kind of, you know, to denigrate them or be that judgmental is just horrible. I'm sure this is probably something you've seen before where like you deal with other people either who come into you as clients or people that you've dealt with when you're at nightclubs who have this extremely misogynistic, almost like cattle-like belief when it comes to women. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely existed. Like even back then, right? They, they were just like, you know, herding them in. Um, and, you know, to say that there weren't moments of my life where I made the mistake of doing that uh, would make me a hypocrite. I, I definitely had the wrong end of the stick when I first started coming from the pickup industry. I learned that that wasn't the best way to do it. And I suspect that you'll find, um, you know, a Andrew Tate, um, that he will at some point come to this conclusion. 
But there is, you know, if you're gaining a lot of notoriety for being controversial, there's a point where you have to ask yourself, well, if I stop being controversial, will people not like me anymore? And that's kind of sad to think about, but that's probably what's going on. Like, I've never had a massive following yeah. because I'm not controversial because I don't pander to what people want. The most controversial thing about me was showing my real life life hidden for two and a half years. Yeah. And that was so controversial that, you know, that it, it ended up going everywhere. But um, there's probably a lot more things that if I bothered to talk to people about, they'd be blown away by. I just too busy enjoying my life do, to, do you, to make a point. Do you ever watch some of those old infield videos? Like for me, I was like, I meet a girl that I end up dating and we, the night we meet, I'm just like talking to her and I say some things and she just starts laughing. My facial, I'm barely moving facial expressions. We're on stage in a nightclub and I'm like, I'm like, you know, just, there's not a lot of movement. There's not even a lot of talking. There's like a little bit of dancing. It would look so fucking boring on a YouTube video. But it's just like so <laughs> devastatingly effective. You know exactly where I'm going with this. And then you would well, watch some infield in video, like back from like 2005, and the guy, the guy's like spitting her around and barking at her. And I'm like, that wouldn't work. And then the video gets 600,000 views. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, I, I, I know. So I, I was one of the people back then that did infield videos. And like, I was one of the first to, to put them up. And, um, you know, my videos were never that impressive. You know, the the thing I, I got known most because I did like the 60 second kiss close. I met a girl on the street, made out with her in 60 seconds. And that was like pretty impressive back then because it was like on the street in the middle of nowhere. Um, but like, you're right. Real game, real game is slow and boring. It's not fun to watch. And uh, I'll always say to you, whatever they're like, oh, but this guy did this thing really, really quickly. I was like, is he still seeing her? Right. That's a lot of effort to never see her again. Yeah. Is he is he still with her? I'm proud of the fact that I can contact women that I've known years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, 20 mm. years ago. Yeah. Who will still talk to me and meet me. And like, not the last time I was in London, but the time before. So it was about three, four years ago. It would have been yeah, 2019, just before, just before COVID. Um, I went on a date with my crush from when I was like 13 because I've always treated women well. And it means that no woman I've ever dated is is unaccessible to me if I ever want to do it again and they're single again and we want to get back together. Um, whereas I know a lot of these guys, when I'm like, could you call her again, that girl from that street listen, broke? Listen, I agree with you, except for two of them. <laughs> two of them that put a hit out on the motherfucker. Uh, but the, the rest of them, yes, I agree with you. There's, there's, there's two of them. They would they'd <laughs> slash a motherfucker's tires. But other than that, you're right. I'm with you completely. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm sure mis, it was a misunderstanding. Ones, right? It was a misunderstanding. Yeah, there's, there's probably crazy ones I've, I've forgotten about. Yeah, right? but but no, but like genuinely, like I'm proud of the fact that I've I've always you know done my best to do right by them as best I can. That doesn't mean I haven't made mistakes. I'm sure there's you know if if one of the women saw this, they'd be like, fuck you, you know you did this wrong or whatever. But um, but you know the, the last time I went to London, I went to dinner with one of my exes. It was me, my fiance, my ex, and her new boyfriend, and um, and we were there. Me and my ex were just like getting on like a house on fire again, of course. And uh, her new boyfriend was like you know a little bit awkward about it. And then she turned to her new boyfriend and said, no, it's okay. I hated him for three years. This is our first catch up. She goes, um, she goes, I hated him. And then I had to realize he was right. And then, then I could like him again. She said, but I needed to hate him first. So she goes, so this is me, you know, apologizing for hating him. And I was like, oh, I had no idea. Cause I had no idea cause she'd never reached out to me. Yeah. But you know, I'm, you know, and like she showed as she got older, her view changed and suddenly it was okay. And I suspect that, um, you know, Andrew, when he gets older, um, will have a view change when, you know, and, and a, I think a factor is kids. I always yeah. tell people one of the reasons that, that I'm different when it comes to dating, especially nowadays, is I have five kids. I'm a, I'm a dad and I view the world differently, but I always wanted to be a dad. So even when I was gaming, I had an idea that I was going to have kids and, you know, wanted a daughter and didn't want to do anything that would make me um, regret <laughs> You know, having a daughter in the future, you know, being like, oh, you know, I treat women badly. I'm, I've always treated them well. Um, I have a module in my, uh, my program, the Men of Action Mentoring Program. It literally is called What Pickup Got Wrong. And, uh, and I've asked Max, uh, I had Max Tarno on here. We talked about this before. And these were the three main, there's several things, but there's three main things. So number one, they were <laughs> completely and totally antithetically, irrefutably, irrevocably wrong about female friends. Completely and totally 
could not yeah. have possibly been more 100%, 180 degrees going in the wrong direction when it came to female friends. That was the first thing. The second thing was uh, social media. They completely missed the boat on that. Like I, I literally remember sitting next to, I won't say who, but it's for a company I used to work for, uh, watching this guy make fun of Snapchat. Make fun of it and then make fun of people on Instagram. Later, of course, years, he's on Instagram. Half his business is coming from Instagram, but he's making fun of it. I do remember one time, I will call him out, I was hanging out with Mystery Matador and and uh, I was telling them, oh, yeah, you know, Owen Cook's doing really well. He's on YouTube. And they were laughing at him for being on YouTube. And I'm like, bro, I don't think you need to laugh at him for being on YouTube. I think you might want to start your own YouTube channel. They completely missed it. And then the third thing where I think guys missed out what were uh, Pickup was teaching you how to bring girls back to your mom's basement. And what you should have been learning was how to get the fuck out of your mom's basement. The, uh, the, 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 the issue was logistics. The third part was logistics. I live on the strip in Las Vegas. That's not an accident. It's because I have to put in so little effort in order to have unbelievable nights out where I'm on stage with Skrillex or Tiesto or whoever, and then 12 minutes later, I'm back at my place with my all the cats that I rescued in a tequila bottles and a game of Never Have I Ever. <laughs> it, that the Logistics, logistics, logistics. Those were the three things that I thought they got wrong. What I'm interested from your standpoint is, what do you, I mean, we've already talked about pre-selection, obviously, and that coming yeah. from female friends. Uh, do you have an opinion when it comes to social media? Because I do feel like they completely missed the boat on this. Um, yeah, I, I think you're probably right. Um, I was different. Like we embraced YouTube 2006 and that was how I got a lot of my uh, initial business. So, you know, I personally was into YouTube and a lot of the, um, the other dating coaches that I knew back then, like, you know, that, that was kind of like what we ended up doing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I do think a lot of people missed the boat, but, but this is the thing, like I still struggle to embrace social media because I just enjoy living my life yeah but, but that's also because you're you're in a place where you have five kids and you live with millions of dollars in, in, in bastrop texas with the greatest barbe <laughs> with, even, the, gra with yeah. the greatest barbecue in the entire fucking world the greatest I sausage mean, link, the greatest sausage links in the world come from bastrop texas the greatest barbecue comes from driftwood texas at the salt lake in case you at didn't fuck it in case you didn't fucking know and, and <laughs> amen, so amen and, 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 and so it's one of those situations where it's a little different for you this is what i always thought because i actually had a coach one time and i was teaching he had me as like a guest speaker or whatever and i was like instagram 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 this is 2012 instagram 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 and he calls me up he goes you got to stop telling these guys to go on instagram you're screwing it up and i realized it's like oh i get it you think your clients are weird and because you think they're <laughs> weird you don't want them on social media exposing their weirdness whereas what i want is for them to not fucking be weird and then go on social media that's the difference that's why yeah. I think they missed it. So I think a lot of these coaches had no respect for their clients. Their well, clients, yeah, but also they they came from a culture of having fake names and hiding themselves, hiding I themselves, remember, hiding themselves. Yeah, I remember like when I came out as AFC Adam, right? My my original name was Adam London, yeah, because I was like, oh, I'm Adam from London. Everyone's like, you're identifying yourself. I was like, why wouldn't I? Yeah. And they're like, well, people might read what you write online. I was like, I don't care. I, I don't care if someone reads what I write online. And I made it AFC Adam so people would leave me alone. But I, I never hid my name because. I'm not ashamed of who I am, but I, you know, and I will say in their defense, and I, I mean, I think a lot of them were just having fake names and hiding who they were. I mean, I remember I had a TV show on YouTube in 2007, I think, with my wingman at the time, who insisted on wearing glasses. I, um, I watched mustache. your I watched your TV show from Al Udeed yeah. Air Base in the UAE <laughs> while I was flying <laughs> missions over Iraq. I watched your TV show on YouTube. And he had his weird mask thing on because he didn't want anyone to know who he was, which you know. Years later, he would uh, he would go to steal my content and release it through a different company. So good for him for hiding his face. Um, but uh, but but my point is, you know, they they did have these fake names, and that's probably why they did that. I I just never embraced it, you know, because I'm so busy living life. And he, like, yeah, I've got kids now, but even back then, I was always like, you know, like I said, I was filming it. So I'd film myself having sex with these four chicks. I wouldn't post it online. Yeah, let's not do that. Let's never, for those right. of you listening to this, let's never post that on a forum. You're going to get, right. well, there's a lot of things, dude. What Mihao was doing, like when, remember when he was filming, well, like he put, he would put like cameras in people's bags and film black and white inside of nightclubs in Los Angeles. Like again, what Mihao was doing, for those of you who don't know, Mihao is one of the first guys to, sh to shoot infield. When he was doing that, like you can't get away with that now. Right. This is one of the reasons why, like, I don't teach pickup and I'm not a coach and there's no infield because I host the biggest bikini competition in the world here in Las Vegas. And I host Babes in Toyland. All that goes away as soon as we get into some of this, like, revenge porn, <laughs> fucking infield shit. I stay the fuck away from that stuff because it's dangerous and it's and, and it's bad. And like, again, 
one of the the big dip, the things, and again, what, well, the reason why I resonate with some of the stuff you say, and by the way, Max, one of the reasons why I had RSD Max on here too, is because you guys understand that women have agency too. Women are part of this as well. And so that's the reason why I appreciate it. Uh, let, let's talk about one other thing, uh, the social media. Um, this is one thing you talked about twice. I saw in two interviews you did. Pulling one of the guys aside and say, hey, let's have a word. What you, th what you think, we'll talk about social calibration. What you think you did was funny. It wasn't funny. It made everyone feel awkward and it was kind of weird. And I call, because I do when I do my group calls, sometimes yesterday we had a group call, it was 99 guys on there. And we do the calls, the guys will say stuff and I'll be like, hey man, I want you to know I love you, but I need you to understand that what you said, no one got your joke. And what you said didn't help you with this woman. It made her feel awkward. Do you understand that? We're not attacking you. Do you 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 have that situation? And I I really I could had resonate last night. with that. <laughs> yeah. I had a yeah, I had it last night. We were we we're playing a board game. Uh, so, you know, in the evenings we'll sit around the dinner table and play board games. And uh, I was playing with one of my friends and he wasn't paying attention to the game. And um uh, he made like a, a bunch of like dumb mistakes. But earlier on in the day, he'd made some dumb mistakes at his work. Not for me, he doesn't work for me, but like at his own work. And uh, he vented to me that people were calling him out for not paying attention and work. And then he didn't pay attention in the board game. So later on, I'm like uh, asking him, you know, what he wants for dinner. And I was like, you know, I've got these two different dishes. You know, do you want both one or the other? And he goes, oh, I'm sorry, you lost me at trying to get my attention. And then everyone laughed and he laughed as well. And I was like, can we talk for a sec? And he's like, what do you mean? And I was like, just, just one second. And he's like, sure. And I was like, why did everyone laugh just then? And he goes, oh, because I was funny. I was like, no. Everyone laughed because everyone's awkward about the fact that it's very clear that you are not paying attention in anything you're doing. You got told off at work for not paying attention. You're clearly not paying attention in the board game and we're all having to repeat ourselves. And now what you think is you making a joke about you not paying attention for me asking you which of the two dishes you want for dinner or if you want both, I don't know if that's real. I can't tell if you're actually paying attention or yeah. not. You look like an idiot. And you think this is funny, so you're carrying it on, or you're pretending to be funny to hide the fact that you didn't listen to me. Either way, no one can tell anymore, and we're kind of laughing at you, not with you. And um, yeah, it, it, you got to do it, right? Like, yeah. if, you're, if you're in a situation where somebody that you know, a guy, is making people around you feel uncomfortable, it is your job as the leader, protector, provider, however you want to look at the group, to help that guy get the fix and, and solution to the problem that he needs. Yeah. A, um, lot, a lot of times people don't understand context. Like what you just said before, we can't tell. Dude, I had an 05. I was a lieutenant colonel in my, in my squadron. He comes in, so I'm a navigator. He comes in one time, and he I don't know if he had Botox, but his face didn't fucking move. He was just a weird dude. And he would come in and one time and he goes, he was just talking to us and looking all around. He goes, yeah, we're going to try to get rid of all the navigators on all these flights. And then we just kind of looked at each other and kind of laughed. And then he walks out of the room and I look at the, like my major and I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? Is, am I out of a job or is he fucking kidding? I don't know. And I was like, this is like the definition of bad leadership. You understand what yeah, I'm saying? Good, like, it good was, that didn't happen in the military. No, it didn't. I mean, it's funny. <laughs> now, of course, he was kidding the whole time, but because his face didn't move or because he wasn't calibrated, I have guys do this all the time. They'll bring up some joke that I told three years ago and or like on some video, they just watch that I can't remember, like episode five of my podcast. And then they'll tell it on the, on the, like in the chat. And I'm like, bro, I think I get your joke, but I'm not sure. You need to provide context with your joke. And a lot of times people who have super high IQs, and you know, a lot of guys who get into this community, very left brain, uh, very, smart, very left yeah. brain, super smart, somewhat autistic sometimes. And they're like, they're, everything's very binary, hyper, hyper intelligent. And they think I'm going to tell the hyper intelligent level 63 joke when we're waiting for the level two joke so that we can laugh. The fart joke, the I, fart joke makes you laugh. The level 63 joke, bro, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, bro. <laughs> I pre please provide context for your joke. I don't get I actually, it. Um, I make this analogy. So I used to be a professional fencer. That was like my, my yeah. jam. I, I love fighting. I've been doing martial arts since I was a kid. I, I'm studying Wing Chun now, actually, um, to, to get my instructorship. But And I do it because I just love it. But um, I always tell people, beginners often mess up experts. Um, not like the best of the best, but like someone who's like, you know, halfway through their training, like, you know, maybe you've got like a blue belt. They'll sometimes struggle with a beginner. And um, it happens a lot in fencing. 
And I always tell people the reason for this is you're thinking three, four, five moves ahead. They're only thinking one move. So you're planning out, moving, reacting, countering, and then suddenly you got hit by their initial move because you've left yourself open to the initial move that in your head, there's no way that they would be doing that still, but they can't think of anything else. They're just going to do it. Likewise, really smart people, like you mentioned, they'll tell a joke, but they'll have so many layers to it that you have to unravel before it's funny that the, the point they're bringing, no one gets because yeah. we're just not on that same level. Um, but it's the same, you know, to bring it back with women as well. A lot of guys will assume that they've already got a lot of credibility and, uh, you know, well, I know I'm a good person, so she should know I'm a good person. So it's OK to make a joke about a dead animal. But actually, she's met you before, and you don't have that report, and it's not okay, right? Hey, so, how you doing? How you doing? My name is Adam. Did I tell you the dead baby joke? Here, let me. How do you how do you make a dead right. baby float? Yeah, and then this freaking, <laughs> and she's like, "That's not funny." And then the guy's like, "No, but I'm a good guy. I'm a nice guy. I swear." Uh, and it's like, no, but you you never you didn't demonstrate that first, man. Like yeah. she never actually got to see it. Yeah, and that's like where I think a lot of guys, you know, they mess this up. They don't realize that um that you gotta. You know, to start basic. Don't assume anything. Like, start from the real beginning. Like, you know, tell the same stories that you've had to tell. <laughs> yeah. But it demonstrates who you are. Uh, I want to pivot to the business knowledge. Like, I did not really realize how much you had got into the acquisition of other companies and, and the other stuff. It, you got into uh, the creating offers and the sales process. First thing I want to ask you, man, because this deals with me specifically. Uh, now, we're, I'm in a unique situation. My sales team could not handle all the leads that we had, especially okay. because we, we had done some things organically. My organic traffic is still greater than my uh, paid traffic. Uh, mm -hmm. We ran paid traffic. We were getting like six to one ROI, and it got to the point where we, I didn't have enough salespeople. So we actually had to hire more salespeople. We had to turn off ads. Then I, I hit my guys up today. I go, Adam Lyon says you should be spending 50% of your revenue on ads. And I was like, bro, we are really going to have to ramp this fucking thing up if we do this. Can you go into that real quick? 50% of revenue on ads. You still believe that? So, yeah. So, yeah, 100%. But there's, there's a couple of things. So, it's, it's ads and marketing is 50%. Okay. Now, that is after cost of goods sold. So that does make a difference. I mean, right? I, sell, so, I sell a coaching product. There's no, there's no cost of anything, right? Except, right, which yeah. is which is totally bad. But in a in a physical product, it is important to know cost sure. of goods sold comes out first, right? Yeah. So, um, but here's why: ads and marketing, unless you're at fifty percent, isn't optimizing the way that it it should be. Um, you know, most of the guys I know that are doing like 40, 50 mil, they're at fifty percent is ads and marketing because you're constantly testing. Plus you're scaling, you know, you, you're constantly pushing that envelope out to, to grow it and get it bigger. Now, um, when a sales team is overwhelmed with leads, really what's happening, it's funny, it's the qualification process is missing. No, we have setters, bro. Yeah. So that's why I'm saying we're doing 40%. We're closing 40% because we set we got setters. But the qualification presetters isn't in place. Yeah. So what what you can do, and this is how we do, we have before they get to the setter. They'll have a sequence of questions yeah, that they have to exactly. answer. Exactly. Yeah. We have we have a, we have a uh, quiz they got to go through. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. And but the quiz scores them. Yes. On how likely they are to buy or close. Yeah. And so what happens is the quiz. So for us, we have a three point metric. So we're like, okay, this person may never buy. This person will buy, but not a, a lot, or will buy after six months. Mm. And then the highest level, these guys are ready to buy right now. You can just like just charge a credit card. And so what happens then is they get scheduled in based on how hot they are. So only the highest level gets scheduled in. Mm. But the set the sales team are never busy because well, not overly busy, because they're just packing in the calendar with people they don't need to sell to. So you can just churn those out 15 minutes. The person already knows what they want, job done. And then you push everyone else to later on, and they're the ones they pick up in dead moments in between phone calls or what have yeah. you as needed. Yeah. Um you can also, uh, you can start automating some of that sales process to really pick it off. Or you could do what I did, which is um, half of Dan Locke's sales team left and I acquired that company. Oh, got um, it. So I've got like a hundred salespeople. So, uh, so if you ever want salespeople, just call me. Yeah. But, um, but you know, the uh, that situation, yeah, you, you should be spending about half on ads and marketing. But like you said, you can't spend it if you don't have a route 
for it to go, right? If you were overwhelmed with too much yeah, ads. So, so what's happened, it's it's not even just the ads, man. We So this is where I went back to the social media stuff. I don't know if you've seen now. If you post reels, anybody who's listening right now, if you post four reels a day, just post four, you very realistically, as a man without fake tits, could get 100,000 real followers very quickly. I've seen, I have a, a couple of coaches that I know, six, 700,000 followers in a year, real followers, because Instagram is so terrified of TikTok that if you, if you consistently produce content for you, they compensate you with organic traffic. And it's been one of these and things. YouTube shorts. Yeah, with well, YouTube shorts are also really good. That's exactly right. But like consistently, it'll be 10K, 20K, 10K, 20K. Then I'll have one with 457,000. Then it's 10K, 20K, 10K, 20K. Then I'll have one with 275,000 of views on, on reels. And it's one of like before with my stories or with my, my, my pictures, it would never be like that. If you consistently, and so because right now we're doing it, we're two hours and 13 minutes of this right here. My, my team is going to pull. 20 20 clips out of this and they're going to put them up as reels over over the course of days we'll tag you in them if you want to be a collaborator on on instagram sure. yeah, bro these that. things uh -huh. these things tear up they tear it up man i cannot walk i am not famous i have fifty thousand followers and i do not have a blue check mark dude i cannot walk anywhere in los angeles or las vegas or miami without people recognizing me like crazy because of these reels it's 91 percent of my engagement because of these reels are to to accounts that do not follow me Accounts that yeah. do not follow me, and so what, what's <laughs> happened? And what's happened is it's like one of these situations where it's like we we so we were working. We had two teams. My my job, me and Char, we were working on organic, and then Miguel and um, Miguel and Grant were working on uh, paid. And so we we were going these two different directions, and both of them worked. And it was just one of these things where, uh, where I go back to what I was saying before, because this is what uh, you were talking about making viral videos. To me, the viral videos that are hitting, it's funny. So for the engagement for this podcast, I probably get probably get six, 700,000 impressions for the podcast every, every uh, depends. If it had Ty Lopez, it's over a million. But uh, yeah. every, every month. On Instagram, bro, it's three million. On TikTok, it's more than that. It's like, like six, I'm sorry, five sixths of my engagement for my podcast is coming from 90 second clips of the podcast. The short form content is destroying everything. It's taking over the world, which is the reason why Andrew Tate goes viral is because it's not because you're watching two hours and 25 minutes of him doing an interview on Nelk Boys. It's the reason it's because you saw a 15 second clip. That's the reason why. And it's this ADD culture that we've had. Remember the guy you said, hey, he doesn't pay attention at work. This is everyone yeah. now. And this oh, is how yeah. you communicate with these people. And it, so that it's so funny. We had um, we brought in a speaker to our business mastermind who spoke about this exact thing about yeah. how like uh, they asked, you know, if Facebook specific or Meta is terrified of TikTok. So it's so funny. I, I know all this theory. The same thing I said. I just can't embrace it because I'm just too busy doing life. I I should like I'll acknowledge that I should. Yeah. I'm just not. Um, but but the to to go back to your point, um, the what what's happening here is you can think of it like a plumbing system. It's kind of how I always describe business. And your tap is on full blast and you've got all that traffic coming in, which yeah. is the water going through the system, but you have a leak or a block somewhere through that's stopping water going through. In your case, as you identified as the sales team. Yeah. So all you have to do is alter, either increase the price. If you increase the price, it will decrease the conversions but you'll make more profit yeah. and they'll be not be overwhelmed. And that's what we did about a year ago. We went from 45 clients to 370 clients in less than a year. And that's that that's what happened and we did our first seven figures in 10 months. So like that that's exactly essentially what I, like explosive growth that happened very quickly. And remember, I'd been teaching this for 14 years for free. And that's why I had so many people like backed up asking me to do this, but that's exactly that's what happened. We raised the and price. And remember you you can increase the price every year cuz inflation like was affected the Yeah, 10%. for sure. So yeah. you have to go up by 10% at least or you lose money. Yeah. Um, and like, I would argue if you're good at what you do and you've got demand, you should go by another 25%, 30%, no question. I um, still, for me, I love coaching so much, bro. I love having a hundred guys on the call. I love yelling at motherfuckers. I love it so much. I never <laughs> want to get to a point where it's so expensive that I can't have a hundred dudes on there, college kids sleeping on a couch, dudes who are 18 who like, I, I want to always be able to give them free content so that someday, you know, when they, dude, you want to know this funny thing? I'll, I'll tell you, I told Owen this one time. I had stolen so much of Owen's content, so much RSD content over the years. I took him to dinner one time. I was like, bro, I owe you this. I, I didn't stole foundations. I didn't stole the blueprint. I didn't stole all of your shit. And I was like, well, you know what? But the, the end, the end, the, in the end, I ended up becoming very interested in it because of all the stuff that had happened before. I still want those people in my life. I still want those people. I don't, I never want to price myself out of, you know, the, the, the working my, or the poor guy or the dude from India. I never want to price myself out of, uh, out of his, his, uh, attention span. So, 
you know, but again, here's what I would do. I would just have like different levels, right? Yeah. So you have the thing that's free or the thing. So like we do a, a free seminar every single month, pretty much. Like we skip a couple like Christmas stuff, but yeah. pretty much every month. And that free seminar, we never charge for it. It's so like we, yeah. we have one coming um, and it will be like a three day workshop. It's completely free. And we will pack hundreds and hundreds of people on it. And to me, that's me giving to those guys. Got it. But then, you know, but the ACE formula is expensive, yeah. but it's not actually expensive. You calculate based on what you get, because we've got all these different coaches, um, you know, it's guaranteed, like actually works. Um, when you go through it, there's nothing else like it that is of that price that is going to work and 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 happen that well, right? Yeah. With that many testimonials, with thousands of them. So, um, so for me, I charge a lot for that because it actually works. And if we lower the price and got more people into it, the chance of it working as well would be worse because we're actually hands-on. There's people yeah. actually going through and helping you, right? Well, well people are so more invested me, when they spend money too. That's the right. other thing. They do the yeah, shit you so ask them to do. You got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so my argument, I, I say you have to increase price. Now what you can do, and we do this a lot, which is really nice, is lock in people that have been there since the beginning. And then every so often, like once a year, you can do what Apple does is you can have a, a yearly moment where the price reverts back to what it was on day one only for people that fit certain criteria. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I like right? that. So, so you could have like, you know, back to school special every August because of kids going to college. Um, if you only earn this much money or less, and you can make it like self-qualified, like, you know, if you want to lie, lie, you know, it's up to you. If you're secretly some rich CEO, but you know, if you want to get in at a discount, sign up during one week, like first week of August, that is it. That is your one week to do it. Yeah. The rest of the time, the price goes back up, and every year it goes up by 20%. So you can either wait to that one week in August or sign up at whatever the current price yeah, the, is. The alumni special, I think that's what we call yeah, it. Alumni right? special, yeah. Yeah, and, and something like that works pretty well. But what, and, and all it will do is it will fix that overwhelm on the sales team. Yeah. Now, you still have to fix the sales team. So they, they need a better system. Uh, you know, uh, there was a, there's a really cool sales technique, which is if you want to decrease the amount of leads you get while not decreasing sales, Make every lead watch a two-hour seminar Interesting. that breaks down everything they need to know before they work with you. Yeah. If uh, they won't watch that, <laughs> you don't want to sign them up. Yeah, that's funny. So Ty Lopez, you remember the uh, uh, Here I Am in My Garage? You know, I was in his house when he filmed it. Yo, yeah. Oh, were you? That's crazy. Yes. So, yeah, so, we're working together at the time. So, so, so when he did that, he the, the sales, the VSL afterwards were 90 minutes long. You would see, you would click the thing and it was a 90 minute sales letter that he did. So you're exactly right. Steps. Yeah, 67 and steps. I know because we were working together and that was one of the things that we spoke. I'm not going to say I gave him the idea because yeah. I didn't. But that, that was, you know, we were all talking about that at that point. It was hysterical. Ty knew that was going to blow up. Yeah. Because I remember we were working on a project and suddenly didn't care about the project we were working on. And he ended up, uh, he ended up not gifting it to me, but he gifted it to the guy that gave me half of it. And I went half with him on the project. Um, but Ty was so confident in the I'm here in my garage thing that pretty much everything else he worked on, he just dropped. And I was always blown away by that because it was before it happened. You know, I'm not a doubter, but I was like, really? This is going to blow up? Well, I mean, then spending $16 million or how much he spent on ads for that when nobody else was using YouTube ads. Like, think about it. You're the first guy to really go that heavy on YouTube ads. And then for him to make that much money off of it. Yeah, I just love that he knew. Like, to yeah. me, that's always the sign for me of like dating, right? Like I know the guys are good at dating when they go, yeah, I'm going to get that one. Because that's what I do. Yeah. You know, I'll talk to them for a bit. I'm like, I got this one. And I'll have all my friends like, yeah, whatever. I'm like, no, I, I got this one. I remember when I first got divorced, I phoned up uh, one of my buddies. He wanted to do a dating product. And I was like, we should do a dating product about dating like multiple women. And he goes, do you just get divorced? I was like, yeah, but I'm going to get in a relationship with like these two women. And I'll probably have a few other women as well. And he's like, but you don't right now. I was like, it's going to happen. And he's like, whatever, Adam. And then it did. <laughs> and he phoned me up. He was like, you called it, bro. I was like, yeah, of course I called it. I, I knew this was going to happen. This wasn't a question. It just took a couple of weeks. But it was always going to happen. That's awesome. Um, and, and, and to me, that's always the marker of someone who knows what they're doing, right? Yeah. Like, like if, I, if like, you know, I, I've organized one, uh, one beauty contest, which was like an old school pickup thing we did like in 2008. But I know for a fact you can organize a beauty contest or a bikini contest. like you can it's not a question it's just a fact you can do it. yeah when 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 wet republic came to me he goes are you sure you're gonna be able to recruit for this i was like bro that's not gonna be your problem your problem is not gonna be my recruiting your problem is gonna we're gonna have other problems but that's not gonna be one of them no i was exactly the same way yeah i was very yeah, very confident you, 
Yeah. And that's it. Same with me with Dane. When I when I when I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna get that one, I'll get it. That's not yeah. a question. Um, likewise, when I'm nowadays when I'm working with business stuff, like I know, like, so I'm in a, and this actually shows the difference in confidence in me in business and dating. I'm in the middle of negotiating for a, 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 like a hot spring hotel in Idaho. I don't know I'm going to get that. I have a chance. I know what I'm doing and I'm good, but I don't know I'm going to get it. But if this was dating, I'd know. You'd know. And that's how I know I'm good at what I do but I'm not the best. And that's why I like this journey because I'm still learning. I'm still on my mission. And it's funny. Um, I, I came out on this other podcast and told everyone that like my success rate is about hundred percent now. And some guy found a video of me in 2008 where I was like, you know, I can't get everyone. And he goes, see, Adam's lying. I'm like, dude, it's 2022. Like, yeah, 14 years ago, I wasn't as confident as I am now. That That's accurate. But yeah. it's 14 years later. Yeah. I'm, I'm 14 years more confident than I was then. But likewise, I hope in 14 years in the future, I will be very confident about acquiring a business that is a hotel or you know anything along these kind of lines. Um, and I do have commercial properties that I've acquired and commercial businesses, which which I've done. But my hit rate is nowhere near as successful as I as I want it to be. But we get there through uh, through practice, and that's what I just loved about Ty. He knew, um, and there's just something really special about that. Like you know, I, I have so much. Um, uh, you know, credibility for the guy to call it and then do it. Uh, you talked about the configuration of your company if you want investors and how people do this incorrectly. And then you showed the chart where it's 50% goes to revenue and then it goes 16, 16, 16. It goes staff, cost, and then mm -hmm. profits. Can you go over that real quick? Like where what do people miss? And then also you mentioned there were six spots in the C-suite, so CFO, COO, all that kind of stuff. Can you talk about, for somebody maybe who's just starting a company, yeah. what are some of the things so, that they miss They miss out on? Uh, I, I was like explaining it with like tiny numbers. Yeah. So let's just say that you, you know, your company is doing 120 grand a year. That is it, yeah. just 120 grand. Um, I would recommend you take 60 grand, put it to one side, use it for ads and marketing. If, you know, which is about five grand a month. Yeah, That's really not a lot. But it should be enough if you use it correctly to grow that business. That leaves you with 60K. 20K of that you want to put aside for staff. Now, you are probably the only staff member in that business, which means your salary for year one is 20 grand. That's it. So people go, well, I can't live off that. Yep. And that means you probably shouldn't quit your day job. You should do the day job and have this on the side and have an extra 20 grand at the end of the year, which is amazing. What a good bonus. And run the business as a side project. You have 20K for costs, which again is really less than 2K a month, but that's going to cover software, websites, uh, QuickBooks, your accountant, all these things that are going to be really important that you need to do. The final 20K is profit, which is one sixth of gross. Um, the reason for that is a company's value is based off of its profit. Now, it's really important. I'm not suggesting that you, um, that, that you report that as profit for your taxes. What I want you to is internally say, okay, that's my profit, I got it. That's the money you can reinvest in things like coaching, training, if you want to, to level yourself up. But be very clear that even though that may now be a business expense because it, you're studying with it, um, and I'm not an accountant, and I'm not saying that's how you should do it, you should talk to your accountant about exactly how to do it. I'm just saying this is a good mental model to say, okay, this amount of money is what I'll spend. As opposed to, wow, I made 120 grand this year, I'm gonna live off of it and I can quit my job. Because you're stealing from the business. Yeah, The business needs to exist in its own right. Mm. And when you steal 120 grand out of a business that's making 120 grand a year, you're, you're crippling the business's chances of succeeding. Got you're it. removing its lifeblood. If you waited two or three years and, and, and had another job, had something on the side, and let it grow and build internally with the correct, uh, the money in the right buckets, it will become so big, it will be able to look after you, which is what we want in a business. You don't want your business to be yourself because now you just have a job and you're your own boss and you work for an asshole. Instead, you want the business to be able to look after you. So that's, uh, it's, it's always funny because everyone's like, well, you're still in dating, whatever. It's like, no, dating looks after me. I have a dating business. Um, you know, my dating business is called Ask the Dating Coach. And inside Ask the Dating Coach, the most successful thing we have is the ACE formula. The ACE formula makes X amount of millions a year, and it spends half of that on ads and marketing. It spends a third on that on all of its stuff. 
It spends a third of it on all of its costs, software, and everything else that it needs. And the last third, it, it has as profit, and it gives that to the founder of the company, which is me. Now, I will often reinvest that money. So I will hand it back to Ask the Dating Coach and say, use this to grow, use this to whatever you want to do, and we'll hire experts and whatever to, to work on the company. But it's not me doing it. It's these people that I've given that last sixth to. That I've decided I do not want to receive it. I want it to, to continue to grow the business. And year after year, the business gets bigger and bigger and bigger because I don't need the money from that because I've got other things that I, I, that I make money off of. So, so you mentioned before you have like eight or nine businesses. Now, have you had this 16. issue? 16 businesses. Have you, have you yeah. had the issue with dynamic pricing? What I mean by that is one of my concerns is uh, because the ROI we are getting on our paid traffic is so high, I've heard stories from uh, numerous people about what happens is eventually uh, Facebook meta starts to crash your CPM and they start to make it more and more expensive for you to get leads because they recognize you're getting alpha. So they want to suck some of the alpha out of your advertising budget. Have you had an issue with that where you're going from like that? Yeah, that explanation's kind of off. A better way okay. to think of it is um, imagine that you have a bucket of water mm -hmm. and you're draining from the bucket yeah. and it costs you an amount of money to pull a percentage out yeah and as the water diminishes the percentage you're pulling is now larger because there's less water in it okay and you're you're, you're fishing in a smaller and smaller amount of water so you're getting billed more and more as the pool diminishes okay so you so, don't you don't think that this is actually something a practice by you think this is just simple mathematics you don't think this is a practice it's by meta. just it's just math uh, I, and you know i know people uh that work at meta so okay. I, I like the, meta isn't that organized <laughs> the reality is they're all segmented departments they're not smart enough well they're probably smart enough but they're not organized enough to be able to pull something like that off. okay so you don't um, think it's nefarious uh uh, uh, uh charging practices no because they don't know what your profit margin is they've got well, no well, idea but, right well, well they might not even know your profit margins they do know all of a sudden you went from spending 50k to a million in a month and they're like well there's something going on here this guy's obviously getting a massive roi and, and every business that's successful in that scenario would never throttle you but when you jump from 50 to a million, it's like switching the sucker from a small one to a huge Got one. Got it. Okay. And now you're draining more water at once and Facebook's algorithm is like, ah. Now, I, I will tell you this. This is really interesting. All the social media algorithms. And I, it's so funny because I work with big companies that deal with this stuff, but I don't have a big social media following. So no one ever believes me um, until you know the companies I've worked with, right? So like I helped Six Pack Shortcuts with their stuff and yeah. they were like one of the biggest. So I've worked with some of the largest companies um, in the, doing this kind of thing, like digital marketer, um, you know, these guys, I, I work with them all the time. So um, I can tell you that the, the the algorithm that it cares about is the experience for not the ad user, but the user. The user, yeah. And if you have an audience of, let's just say you're targeting 700,000 people and you're spending so much money that the only ads they're seeing is you, now that is going to piss off the algorithm. Yeah, that's what, yeah. Because it's not to be nefarious, it's because they want the user to have a varied ad experience. Mm. Because if the user doesn't like you, and all they ever see is you on social media, they stop using social media. Well, yeah, I mean, whoever's getting the 20x ROI is going to spend the most money. Whoever's getting the 15x ROI, he's going to spend money, but not as much. And so eventually what would happen in a perfect, you know, a free market economy is the guy spending the 20 ROI is going to end up spending infinite money and you're going to see one ad on Facebook ever. So I do and understand that, what you're saying. And that's why the smart play, which is what people are doing, is you acquire your competitors. Mm. And that's what I've been doing in the dating game for the last 12 years. Got it. Because now, like I said, all roads lead to me. Lead to it doesn't, doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which dating program you go to, you end up at the, you know, the high end coaching, which is what I like. You're going to end up, or once upon a time, you'd end up at our company. Not so much anymore, because yeah. that's not what I'm doing. Anymore. But that's what I did for a long time. You talked about uh, the Ask a Dating Coach being like a system, a passive system, passive dating program that you have now. Can you talk about building these systems so that later on they take care of you? What are the what are the steps in that? Yeah, so that's that's our that's our the Smart Blueprint program, right? So um, I developed this for myself because we would acquire a company and then we would like sit down with the drawing board and be like, how do we fix this one? And we do this so often. I was like, I'm tired of redesigning it. Can we not just make a blueprint and follow it? So we built it. And then some of our clients recognize similarities. They're like, oh, you're doing the same thing you did in this other company. Because you know we use the same mailing list when we launch a new company or when we acquire a company, um, we'll 
you know, tell them the old mailing list, oh, hey, we just acquired this, go check it out. And they recognize the flow, you know, they'll be like, oh, we're going through the same process. So then our business clients would say, do you have that process written down? Can we get it? And then we realized after giving it away a bunch of times, we should probably sell it. Mm. So that's what we developed. So we essentially have a three-step process that we tell people, um, which is educate, indoctrinate, conversate. Mm. Educate is all about making sure that you are teaching people the answers to the problems they have and not promoting yourself. You just solve problems. So, um, you know, if a, let's just say like a, a fitness, like we have a fitness company, our fitness company will talk about um, why the food you're eating might make you feel bad afterwards, even though you think it's healthy. And so it will talk about gases that are built up in foods that are promoted as being good. And um, it will talk about, um, you know, you might like the taste of that meal, but if you get tired afterwards, here's your body's struggling to process it. And then it will be like, if you want to know more about why this is happening, feel free to, you know, drop a text message here or give us your email address and we'll explain. And so they go from educate where we go, oh, you've noticed that you feel bad after eating this food you thought was good. If you want to know why, click here. And they go into indoctrinate. Indoctrinate is where you explain to them your process. Hmm. Now, it's really important that you be as objective as possible. You can't say, this is how it is. You got to say, look, this is what we've found, or this is what we've discovered, or this is what we believe. Um, and there are going to be people that don't like that. They're like, you're full of crap. I don't like that. And that's fine. You want to get rid of those people. We don't want to talk to people that don't agree with the methodology or don't like it or you know, we want those people to go away. So that's the qualification process. We're filtering the people out that don't like the conclusions you've come to. In this final stage, the stage that gets to the salespeople, we only have people that are moving towards a conversation that love what we have to say, agree with everything, love the fact that we're doing it, and they want to talk. They want to get on the phone. Now we have the final line before conversation. This is our qualification process, like I said, where we, we filter them. So like, whether you're at one of three stages. You either want to buy it, at which point you'll fill in the form. We'll identify that you're a buyer and you'll speak to a salesperson, talk to you 15 minutes, close the sale done. You're potentially going to buy or might buy something, but not the best thing we have. You're going to be scheduled at some point in the future. You're going to be given a bunch of free trainings to help speed up that process and see if that's right for you or make help you make the decision not to buy, which is great too, because you don't spend time with salespeople. Yeah. And then we've got this last criteria. We're like, this person's probably not going to buy and they're just given a bunch of free stuff. And we're like, good luck to you. We don't even attempt to sell them or get them on a phone call. Don't try and close them. That means the only people that end up in our sales process are the highest level people. Yes. So this is why I, I made a, a joke the other day, like my Instagram and my Facebook, I got 10,000 followers on Facebook and like maybe 2000 on Instagram and yet made a $50,000 sale last month yeah. on social media. And one $50,000 sale from all my social media, just one, I probably made some other ones as well, but there was one that I'm aware of because they went through the whole process, came through to the sales team. The phone call was, hi, I'd like to sign up for Adam's most expensive thing. Literally said it like that. Yeah. And the person said, okay, uh, no problem. It's 50K, it went great. And they said, after I buy it, can you tell me what it is? They had no idea. <laughs> and they didn't care because they'd been they'd gone through the whole process. They just agreed with everything I said. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'll just buy. Yeah, this is a really great point. So uh, I, I you don't have fifty thousand followers recently, and it's just because of the it's because of the reels, guys. I was not that popular a couple months ago. It's just recently <laughs> we figured out a, we hired someone who knows what she's doing, and we've been able to blow up since then. We're just copying what other coaches are doing. And in doing so, I'm going to let you guys know that like it is very capable for us to do 200k a month. Me not having a blue check mark and not having a, a ton of followers. Now, in my case, it's unusual because so many people with blue check marks do follow me. Uh, but but in general, you could have 10,000 followers and run a seven figure business. You guys need to worry about d does this generate? Does your platform? It's like think of it like your calling card or your office. Is this something that you want to join? Click the link in the bio and then go buy. The number of people that need to buy doesn't even have to be one tenth of one percent of your entire audience in order for you to run a seven figure business. So that that's the thing. Like a lot of I get this question all the time, like, well, what about followers? What about followers? This is not what's important. What's important Correct. is is your offer good? Is your VSL? I know good? a lot of broke people that have, have huge, huge followers. followings. That's my next yeah. point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Who who come to me because they need to monetize what they've got. Yeah. I, like I, I, one of my businesses that I, I'm a partner in, I, I acquired 40% of a dating coach's business and he's got 200,000 followers. 
But our, we did a promotion recently for a dating event, a joint dating event. Yeah. He made a single sale. We made 22. Yeah. That's of crazy. a very expensive, like seven day uh, vacation trip. And, you know, he was like, dude, how are you doing this? You've got no followers whatsoever. And I was like, but my followers are buyers and they know that my shit. Yeah, works. that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah, I only need 22 sales from people paying 10 grand to make 220 grand in a month and do nothing just for dating, right? Not counting the other 16 businesses. Yeah. Um, and that 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 point of having the targeted qualified buyers, and because our sales process is actually designed to push people away, except for the, the ones, ones who are really willing. The ones that are hot. That's nice. Yeah. Uh, you also talked about going on vacation, uh, you know, with your, with, you know, you had a cruise and you guys made mm -hmm. money off the cruise because it was like eight grand a person. It was 1100 bucks a person in expenses. So we do something similar. We go to Paradise Challenge. I don't know if you know what the Black Tape Project is where the girls are all dressed in tape. They're like wearing tape bikinis out of electric nice. tape. So I'm the host of that. And so my staff and a bunch of my clients come out to that and we don't directly charge them, but we make so much money just from the content. And so just so, so like guys get it, kind of what you said before, educate, indoctrinate. It was sort of, yeah. sort of like the indoctrination of how the whole pro program works. And it's one of these things where it's like our vacation ends up being one of the most profitable things, especially from a uh, AV standpoint, from a, from a content standpoint, it ends up becoming I mean, like one of the most profitable uh, highest ROI things that we do. So I love that idea when you were talking about you guys ho uh, host a cruise and write the cruise and it ends up being your vacation that you were going to take anyway, but it ends up being profitable. Yeah, well, it, it came about, it was, um, it was, it was terrible is how it started. I don't know if it, it's kind of interesting. Um, we just had our first like big, big year. Like I was like working everything out and um, it was actually how we developed the ACE formula. Um, we were about to go on a three week vacation um, and we were actually, it was when I was still with Brooks. So this is like, you know, in the throuple like years ago. And um, we, we'd, uh, we'd just made a ton of money and celebrated with a three week cruise in Asia. So it's like from leaving Hong Kong, going to Singapore. And we were super excited. Um, and then there was like a side trip to Shanghai. Ah, oh, it was great. And the day we're leaving, um, the, the, the mail arrived and Eve, my fiance was about to grab the mail. I said, don't read it. I like knew, you know, and she opened it up and there was a tax bill for half a million dollars. Mm. And, um, and, and we were just, we did not have that kind of cash in the bank. I mean, and uh, you know, we were dumbfounded. Like it's just shock, you know, half a million, like a house, you know? Yeah. Um, and I remember um, I, I looked at her and she looked at me, she broke into tears, like, um, cause we're like, how are we going to do this? And I phoned my accountant and was like, what happened? And he's like, remember when I told you the bill was going to be 50K? And he's like, that was an error on my part. I meant 500,000. I put the, the, yeah. the dot in the wrong place. And I was like, there's so much. I mean, we fired him right instantly. There's so much wrong with this. Um, so we get on the cruise ship and we've, we're freaking out. I mean, we flew to, to Hong Kong. We're in panic mode. It's like, do you want a coffee? No, you know, like, like that's gonna make a difference, you know. Um, yeah, I can't possibly spend a two dollar coffee. And we sit down on the on the cruise, and I look at her and I said, No matter how many coffees we say no to, that's not gonna pay this bill. We don't need 50 bucks, we need 500,000. We can't sell enough coaching to cover this either. The only way this works is if we stop selling my time. I was like, we've spoken a long time about what it would look like if I had free time and wasn't just coaching and teaching all the time. I was like, I think today's the day the universe is forcing us to develop a program that I'm not needed for. I was like, over the next three weeks, we can either stress about how we're going to make money or we can finally automate the entire business. And um, we initially sat down and said, let's think about it. And then what I wanted to do was like, write my dating process, you know, because I was like, I can spend the next three weeks writing my dating process. But that actually wouldn't have been useful. And that was one of the things I learned about business, which it doesn't matter how good you are at dating, that's not going to make money. No, no one cares. It's like, it doesn't matter how good the movie is if no one likes the trailer. I was like, we have to develop the marketing business and systems first, then we'll teach the dating. And she's like, well, how do you know the dating will be good? I was like, we just got to trust that after, you know, 12 years of teaching dating, um, that it's going to be good. So 
we developed the ACE formula as a system that any guy can follow and get their perfect girl and get a relationship. And it had to be guaranteed because we were going to have thousands of people go through this. We knew that at the time. We needed thousands, right, to, to make to pay the bills. I was like, it needs to work. We can't have refunds because we can't afford that. It's got to just be good. And so we developed all these automations and these sales processes and marketing and stuff. Halfway through the cruise, we developed all the structure and hadn't developed the dating program yet. And I was like, if we want to pay this bill, we have to start selling today so that when we get back. So we sold it with a start date in January. This cruise was like in October. So we had three months once we came back to develop the content. Um, but we sold constantly. And that's when we knew we had a winner because this thing sold like hotcakes. We'd made like quarter million by the time we came back. And wow. it just kept selling from then on. And the best part is we got to like December and I, I still hadn't written anything. And I look at her and I'm like, we have made so much money and I haven't had to teach dating once. Mm. I was like, I will now spend the next couple of weeks, like, cause we always take Christmas off. Uh, we take like a 10 day vacation over Christmas to spend time with family and stuff. I was like, let's stay at home this year and I will spend 10 days and I will, I will design the best dating program anyone's ever seen. And so I just sat down and poured everything out. So I did the 10 days over Christmas just before the start of the program. And then the first six months of the ACE formula, I taught live with all my coaches and had them deliver each section of it. So each coach is an expert in a different section. And I monitored the results. So we have a lot of feedback from the students every day, like, did this work? And I would constantly, if it didn't work, that module got scrapped and I made a new one. And we did that throughout the whole program. So it was kind of like the A-B testing. It was tested on the students. So I gave them homework. They'd go and do it. Hey, how did that work? I got nothing. That was a shit module. Fuck that one. Create a new one. And that, so for six months, I built it with those initial students. And then, then we had it. Beautiful, man. Hey, uh, man, thank you for uh, doing this. I appreciate it. There was so much value in this, man. We've gone over two and a half hours and uh, I really appreciate it, man. Uh, like, I, like I said, man, we've been orbiting and I've never really gotten a chance to talk to you for a couple hours about this stuff because I knew we had a lot of stuff in common. So I appreciate it, man. It's the same thing, right? You're like, yeah. you, you have someone, you're like, I think I'd like this guy, yeah. but I don't know him. Yeah. Um, and people always be like, you ever heard of this Michael Sartain guy? I was like, I do know him. Like, yeah. I've, I know him through these people and yeah. these people. I just never met him. Yeah. I, we, we bumped into each other a couple of times and yeah. every time I was like, this guy's great. But yeah, yeah, I, I think twice it. in Austin we met, like in 2010 or something like yeah. that. Uh, Once me, in Vegas. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. Let me know. Uh, let me know next time you come out to Las Vegas. I'm still here. Uh, what? Well, I'll make. Actually, I'll make a point. Like you'll be the deciding factor. I'll come out. I'll come out no matter what. Beginning of January, just to just. Oh, beginning of January. Hi. I was gonna say come out August 26, where I we host uh, the sixty-two thousand dollars we're giving away for the Playboy presents Yandy Summer Search Bikini Competition. Uh, oh God, was that this this year, August 26th? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I know you probably can't make it, but, but I'm just letting you know, like, uh, that's what I do during the summers. And then we uh, we have a bunch of, uh, during the January, man, that's a uh, convention season. So we're going to have. Yeah, that's what I figured. Because like I said, I think I'm going to come out for the ABNs because of the Super Bowl. Oh yeah, dude, uh, ABNs, I got you, bro. No problem. I will cool. introduce, yeah. I'll get you, we'll get you a press pass in two seconds. It's real, real, real fun. I do interviews. Yeah. I, a bunch of the girls know me. I, I walk around with a camera and just interview people and I ask them questions about Ukraine and tax policies. I love going up to like these, these porn stars and I'm like, hey, what would you you do to uh, uh to end child homelessness like i, I love this is my my favorite thing to do during ibns i ask them questions like so the rise in interest rates how do you think that's going to affect things and then i, I ask it to some <laughs> girls like with pasties on <laughs> i love that shit anyway man uh, i'm excited to have you come out here where can we find you man yeah so i mean for everyone watching like i said uh, i actually agree with michael i love giving away free stuff so aceformula.com or theaceformula.com, there is so much free content there. Like go there, consume it, enjoy it. Um, if you're into dating and that's what you want to learn, um, there is no obligation to sign up. Just enjoy the free stuff. Um, if you like it, if you resonate and you want to work with us, that's fine. Um, then there's thesmartblueprint.com is our business program. That's where we have all of that good stuff. Uh, but you find me on social media at the Adam Lyons. You find me on Instagram. I've got like a thousand followers. You can be like number a thousand and one or something. Um, and, uh, and on Facebook and everywhere else, all the other socials are exactly the same URL. Um, you know, totally welcome getting to meet people and helping them out. Um, so yeah, say hi. 
Awesome, man. Hey, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I will tell you in the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, I, I keep saying this every week, nothing but gratitude for you. I cannot believe how many people have started listening on Spotify and Apple. That was the, the one thing that was surprising to me is how many more people are on Spotify and Apple uh, because those people tend to listen to the entire episode. Uh, on YouTube, obviously, the growth has been tremendous. Uh, shout out to all the people who came. The one two weeks ago with Justin Waller was incredible. Ty Lopez obviously has got like four or 500,000 views. Uh, I want to say thank you guys to all of you who've come in there, left comments. Uh, and then the explosive growth on, on Instagram and uh, TikTok. And shout out to all the, the 20 people who have made fake fucking accounts of me on Instagram. Thank you guys. Every day I have to report new accounts. So I want to say, apparently I'm doing something right, but I want to say thank you guys for subscribing. Please like, share, and subscribe. We have a bunch of great clips that are coming out of this one, and we will see you all next week. You're awesome. <laughs>